Hey, well, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Welcome back uh, to day two. So welcome back, and uh, just as a safety uh, announcement for those of you who weren't here yesterday, there's two exits from this room, one at the back of the room by the flowers, and there's a stairwell that goes in that direction. There's also a stairwell down this end of the corridor. Uh, that is not an exit at the back of the room. So with that, uh, this morning we're taking a close look at the ecology of the Delta. And what I'm going to do is introduce all three speakers uh, for their presentations and then invite them to sit at the front uh, for the Q&A session. So the first speaker will be Louise Conrad. Um, she serves as the California Department of Water Resources lead scientist. She works within the DWR executive team to guide the advancement of applied sciences to inform water resources management and facilitates application of best practices for conducting and communicating science at DWR. And she's also a PhD ecologist. Before entering the lead scientist role in 2022, Louise served as a deputy executive officer for science at the Delta Stewardship Council, where she guided science funding processes, public workshops on Delta ecology and management, and served on the editorial board of the 2022 uh, issue of the state of Bay Delta science. <clears throat> the second speaker will be Dr. Steve Lindley from NOAA. He serves as the director of the National Marine Fisheries Southwest Fisheries Science Center, Fisheries Ecology Division, and the Santa Cruz Laboratory. He leads the center research program on California demersal and anadromous species. He is also a researcher at UC Santa Cruz Institute of Marine Sciences. His research interests include the ecology of anadromous fish, statistical and numerical modeling of ecological processes, time series analysis, and animal telemetry. He's published over 85 articles in the peer-reviewed literature. And for those of you who are uh, familiar with Steve's research group, they're li literally uh, recognized throughout the world. The third speaker will be uh, Matt Nabriga from the US F uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Matt has over 30 years of state and federal government experience working on Central Valley fish issues, particularly in the Delta. Since 2016, he has been the assistant field supervisor for modeling and water operations in the Fish and Wildlife Service's San Francisco Bay Delta Fish and Wildlife Office. In that role, he supervises senior level scientists who work on Delta smelt supplementation, quantitative analysis of fish and environmental data, and in support of various interagency and regulatory efforts. He also serves as a science advisor to his office's regulatory program, its field supervisor, and staff at the services Pacific Southwest Regional Office. So with that, I'd like to thank all three speakers for being here. And uh, Dr. Conrad, would you like to kick us off? Thank you. Good morning, panel and everyone. Good to be with you today. I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion that started yesterday. It's really um, glad to be here. So I was asked to present on a bit about present day ecology. This is going to build on talks you received yesterday from Dr. Summer, Josh Israel, and Lenny Grimaldo. And before jumping into the slides, I wanted to reflect for a moment on Renee's very important question during the final panel yesterday about whether some of the thoughts that came forward in that panel were really pertinent and relevant to the charge that is before you. And wanted to note that this talk is, is in the category of important context. This is context that many of the things we're talking about um, are, are loosely or not really in control um, or controlled by the factors, the management actions that are listed specifically in your charge. However, I do think this is really important information to have about the landscape and um, 
and habitat and the state of it that is affecting all of these fish that are subjects of those management actions. So, um, and then last note before jumping into the slides, I wanted to acknowledge some DWR colleagues that were very helpful in crafting this presentation. In particular, Dr. Rosemary Hartman, who, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, leads the interagency ecological program synthesis team and produced some of the graphics that you're gonna see. Okay, so when thinking about ecology, it's always helpful to have a conceptual model. This is a simplified, very simplified version of what Josh Israel showed yesterday. Um, and its premise is that any species and its ability to survive, grow, and reproduce is a product of factors that start with their position on the landscape and moves through environmental drivers, such as temperature that then set the stage for the predation risk they experience, the food densities that they experience, that um, then translates into their status and their ability to move through their life cycle. So all of these, uh, sorry, let's see, um, getting used to my setup here. I'm gonna focus my time on the middle tiers here, because I think you heard a lot about the landscape and how it's shifted and how position on the landscape is really important. You heard about that from Lenny and from Ted Summer. And then the next two speakers are gonna speak a lot about species responses. So I'm gonna focus on environmental drivers and habitat attributes. So uh, setting the overall hydrological context, this is a graph that you saw yesterday as well, just a, a little bit of a different coloring of it. Um, you're going to hear more about the present climate later today, I believe, from Dr. Michael Anderson, the state climatologist. But uh, I think this is important to reflect on in the context of Delta smelt and salmon, too, um, and for this presentation. So we have the water year types for the Sacramento Valley Index for the previous about six decades. The last decades have been, last two decades have been really marked by drought punctuated by single years of very wet conditions. If 2023 were on this graph, sorry that it's not, you'd see another year of extreme wet on the heels of three years of critical dry conditions. Um, the length of the drought of this, this 20 years, these, this um, hydrological context for 20 years, I think is really relevant to species conservation because of the number of generations that the species that we're managing have to contend with this. So for salmon, which have an average life cycle of about three years, for 20 years, that's, that's six three-year cycles, which is two complements of three consecutive brood years. So it becomes really hard to bounce back from uh, conditions that are, are impacts of drought. And then for delta smelt, an annual life cycle, it's really, really hard. So you keep getting... Um, put down kind of year after year, one, one flashy chance to make it better, but that's not even the full complement of brood years for, for salmon. So let's, that's broad hydrological context. Let's think about, let's look at some um, environmental drivers with respect to water quality. One factor is water clarity of direct relevance to Delta smelt that prefer turbid water. This graph um, comes from the Interagency Ecological Program Seasonal Monitoring Report. You'll get these slides, and there's an active link there that you can use to see the full report, which is updated several times a year. Um, this is showing the water clarity measured by Secchi depth for fall months and shows a, a pretty remarkable increase in water clarity starting at the beginning of this century. Um, the change here is, has multiple reasons really for it. Um, there has been a change in sediment supply. As you may be aware, the hydraulic mining uh, increased the amount of sediment coming into the system in the late 1800s, but then the supply is cut off by the construction of dams such that the erodible sediment supply within the system becomes the main source of suspended sediment. Um, in the late 1990s, you saw on the last graph a lot of wet years it's hypothesized that those wet conditions pushed out a lot of that available sediment, um, such that we saw a step increase in water clarity at the beginning of the century. But that's not the only reason that we're seeing water clarity increase. We also have seen a dramatic expansion of aquatic vegetation, invasive aquatic vegetation, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, 
Dr. Erin Hester and her colleagues from UC Merced um, examined trends in declining turbidity along with the expansion of SAV coverage. And we're able to show statistically that even after accounting for the change in sediment supply, you could explain a lot of the change in water clarity with the expansion of SAV. Sorry, submerged aquatic vegetation. I'll try not to use acronyms. Okay, another really important water quality factor is water temperature. And we talked a little bit yes, uh, yesterday about the availability of quite a bit of data um, now because of longstanding monitoring programs. A lot of the fisheries monitoring surveys are always putting a, um, a, a thermometer in the water at the same time that they're collecting fish. And Sam Bashevkin and Brian Maharshda too, who's in the audience here, published this great paper um, just a few years ago where they were able to integrate data sets from all these different discrete um, monitoring surveys that are collecting water temperature data. And with this large data set, we're able to detect a change in water temperature with an average change of 0 0.17 degrees Celsius per year. There was regional and seasonal variation in this pattern with the highest rates of temperature increase occurring in the North Delta. And with the spring months seeing especially some, some important um, relatively high rates of increase. So this becomes really important for Delta smelt. And Dr. Larry Brown uh, published a, another relevant paper here uh, which where he used downscaled climate models and compared that to the thermal habitat for Delta smelt. And where it's able to show in a really powerful paper the how the thermal habitat is being constricted and is projected to decrease quite a bit so that their opportunity for maturing and actually spawning is becoming more limited over time. So let's start talking about some of the biological factors um, that affect habitat. There's a story of reduced productivity in the, in the Delta that you may have heard of before. I wanted to shine a light on this important paper from Dr. Jim Clern from a few years ago. We heard about how there's been a lot of land reclamation, reduction in tidal marshes. The, this analysis, which looked at the estimated primary productivity contributions from different plants existing in different habitat types, including phytoplankton, and their contrib relative contribution to overall net productivity for the system. Um, this shows that the estimated contribution from tidal marshes is really an outsized part of the total productivity. And that with a huge reduction in habitat loss, we've seen this paper estimates that the net primary productivity is reduced from historical conditions by over 90%. The good news is that with tidal wetland restoration, we could start moving things in a more positive direction, but we're a very long way from achieving the historical conditions. And you can't talk about productivity without mentioning invasive clams. So there are two major invasive clam species that occupy the benthos. There's corbicula, which is a longstanding introduced species and occupies more of the freshwater aspect of the system, and potamocorbula, which uh, was introduced, first observed in 1986, and has a more saline distribution. This graph is showing from 1976 to 2022, the concentration of chlorophyll in the system. And you see, again, at post introduction of the Potamocorbula species, a dramatic decrease in, in that concentration. Other research has shown that this has impacted also secondary uh, consumers with zooplankton. That's um, Dr. Kimmerer's paper cited there. Though I wanna note that there are other consumers that may have contributed to this productivity decline, including introduced zooplankton and jellyfish. So getting to zooplankton a little bit more specifically, the assemblage has been one of a shifting assemblage over time. It's large changes from the historical community, which includes mycids and cyclopoid species, which um, are no longer uh, as prevalent as they were. And overall, we see this reduction in biomass. Um, there's been this proliferation of Pseudodiaptimus and Limnoithona over time. And these, importantly, these are introduced species that have, uh, they're progressively smaller and they have lower nutritional value to fish. 
Importantly, though, even these three species highlighted here in um, one of other another paper from Dr. Kimmerer uh, shows that even what they would be should be able to grow and produce eggs, they're doing so at a lower rate than would be expected based on their temperature in Bay Delta waters. Okay, um, I wanna mention briefly harmful algae. This is something we can talk more about um, on the bus tomorrow. Multiple routine monitoring programs now do visual assessments for the presence of microcystis, which is one of the more common harmful algal bloom taxa that we have. And between 2007 and 2021 here, we saw an increase in high densities, the colony forming events. And this is especially um, concentrated in the lower part of the system. So continuing more on the story of primary producers, um, I mentioned aquatic weeds before, and I think I, I just wanna go into a tiny bit more detail here. Our invasive aquatic vegetation community is um, comes in all forms of floating, emergent, and submerged species. All of those are typically dominated by, by non-native species. And we know now from empirical evidence that came from some USGS researchers that submerged aquatic vegetation attenuates the current and traps sediment. This then acts as this giant filter that I've mentioned before. And really importantly, it not only might be clearing the water, but also making that sediment unavailable for marsh accretion. Um, this ink expansion in aquatic vegetation has not gone without attention and investment in control. There is a 40 year program that is still running on uh, on control, but it's very hard, especially for submerged aquatic vegetation to achieve effective treatment. And we've done this, or looked at this statistically, uh, looking at treatment records and the same area over time. And we've done this in selected field sites and shown that it's really hard to, to treat this and, um, and usually stays despite a lot of effort at a similar um, level of coverage. SAV, worth noting, there's been a uh, aerial imagery that has been collected almost every year since 2003. And between 2008 and 21, we saw an increase in coverage from seven to 21% of all the waterways in the Delta. I wanna just make a little plug for synthesis, which came up yesterday during the panel. Um, one of the things I neglected to mention was the Delta Science Program support for the state of Bay Delta Science and providing leadership um, in a biennial pattern um, of issues that summarize the science on a given topic. And the 2022 edition was on services and disservices of primary producers. So before closing, a few notes about predatory fishes. Um, increased vegetation along the Delta shoreline has meant important changes for the fish community. Um, again, this part of the ecosystem is dominated by non-native species and increasingly centrarchid, sunfish and bass. These are um, different electrofishing data sets, one that took place in the early 80s and then in 2009 and 10. And we see this decrease in native fishes and a really big increase in largemouth bass. Um, it's notable that this increase in largemouth bass drives a major recreational fishery in the Delta. It's known as a world-class bass fishery, and uh, there's money uh, in it for some people. So I want to give a nod to striped bass as well as an important predator for, for native fishes. Um, Matt Nobrega is really the expert, um, so he can tell me everything that I get wrong here. But this is a longstanding introduction species thought of as a naturalized predator uh, species in, in much of the Delta by some. Um, the young of the year uh, actually have declined and are part of this larger pelagic organism decline that was mentioned yesterday. But still the older individuals do present a non-trivial and important threat to salmon out migrating. And these two recent papers cited on this slide show that this might be a increasing concern over time as there may be more of a temporal overlap with striped bass moving into the system earlier than they did previously. And um, when you reach over 20 degrees, then there's this potential for a multi-predator effect to really impact fish as they move through the system. Okay, so finally, you've heard this before, but I am gonna say in terms of the ecology, it's always changing. Um, in addition to some of the things that I've talked about, there's a 
whole host of other changes that are always kind of going on and these monitoring programs do help track it. So increased abundance of Mississippi silver sides, which are eating many of the same things as um, Delta smelt. Brian Maharsha's paper showed that um, this substantial increase in one of his uh, paper in 2016. And then also the presence of Wagasaki smelt and the potential now documented for hybridization with Delta smelt. And then of course, new invaders, including abiotic ones in the form of contaminants um, are, are other factors at play within the ecology. So with that, that concludes what I was going to talk about and I'll take a seat and hand it over to Steve Lindley, I think. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Steve Lindley. I am a salmon ecologist and oceanographer that works for NOAA, as Peter told you. Uh, I was online yesterday. And I really appreciated all the great introductory material that you uh, were bombarded with. And it really reminds me of the, the allegory of the blind people trying to describe an elephant. Every person that speaks to you has a certain perspective. Uh, they're holding the elephant's tail or feeling it's hide or maybe getting stepped on by the hoof. Uh, and each one is an incomplete picture of, of this elephant. And I'm going to give you yet another perspective, which is an ecological one, really uh, from the perspective of uh, salmon or salmon is generally, but mostly uh, Chinook salmon. Um, yeah, so we'll start out with something you may have learned in, in kindergarten, the generalized salmon life cycle. Um, Salmon are fascinating. Uh, some people think they're disproportionately the subject of attention of research and, and management. And I'll try to let you give you some understanding of why that actually is, because there's so much diversity within and among species of salmon that it's really not just one thing. Uh, but you probably all learned that, that salmon have this epic life cycle and you can start wherever you like, but I'll start with the adults, which uh, spawn in rivers for Chinook salmon, relatively large rivers, and they like cobble and gravel bedded rivers, and they have very particular places they like to dig in a, a nest where they lay relatively few, very large eggs, a few thousand, and rather than millions like a striped bass might lay. So a lot of maternal investment into those eggs, uh, which they bury in the gravel, and they, um, they're they really up on the limit of how big you can make a fish egg and have it survive due to the oxygen transport. So oxygen is an important uh, variable as well as flow. Um, the female will guard that nest for a while, and then, as you all publicly learned, she will die. They only spawn once, uh, steelhead. Actually, everything I say, there will be an exception that I, you could point to, but I'll try to just talk about the generalities here. So they die after they spawn. The eggs live in these gravel pockets for uh, a couple months, typically, and then the eggs hatch, and there's a, the next phase is this alvin phase where they have a large yolk sac, and they hang out in the gravel as they absorb that and grow. And when they run out of yolk, they need to come out of the gravel and begin feeding on benthic invertebrates and things like that. Um, and they may rear there, depending on the, the population or species, for a few days to maybe a year or even more in more northerly climes uh, near where they were born. Or they may move downstream, and generally they are going to move downstream over time, uh, where their habitat preferences change as they develop. They prefer uh, deeper, swifter water. Uh, larger prey, and eventually they will undergo a transformation, uh, physiological and morphological, from something that looks like a little trout to something that looks like a little salmon, which we call smolts. And they go from defending uh, territories and being aggressive to one another to starting to school up, and they, they move out uh, into the ocean. And they, they do this first phase in freshwater, it's thought, because the risk of dying from predators is relatively low compared to the marine environment, but there's not a lot to eat. Uh, which is, you know, the flip side of that coin. They're relatively oligotrophic 
environments compared to the coastal oceans that salmon rivers uh, empty into. So at some point, it becomes advantageous to risk being in the ocean because the growth potential is so high. The fish will move out under the coastal ocean, and depending on their species or population, they may live in coastal waters uh, some hundreds of miles from their natal river or make um, giant ocean migrations throughout the North Pacific. Uh, after a year to four years of doing fairly mysterious things in the high seas, they will uh, start to mature and they will return to the river, usually where they spawned, and then migrate back up river, which could be uh, a few kilometers for something like a pink salmon to many hundreds of kilometers for Chinook salmon to elevations that can be as high as 1500 meters or more, uh, where this cycle is then complete. So um, each life stage has also its particular habitat requirements. So um, some of the things that we can measure and understand about that, and there's a huge literature on a lot of this for going back many decades, for, for the adults, they have very particular depth, so, um, water velocity, substrate and temperature requirements, and oxygen is a very important um, element, as I mentioned. Um, and the juveniles, they need all of those things too, but their preferences do change, as I mentioned, uh, as they grow and mature. And then in the ocean as well, um, they are governed by uh, especially water temperature and uh, food, and depending on the species, they, they have other more complicated uh, requirements or preferences. So that's the general picture. You cannot understand and you should not think about salmon in the absence of their habitats. This is one of the most important points I want to make. They exist. They have evolved to take advantage of what you can call a shifting habitat mosaic. There's a number of concepts that are useful for this in the stream ecology literature. Also, this idea of habitat templates or habitat filters, that there are these requirements that they have are dynamic in, in time and space, and the opportunities are as well. And what we see salmon doing is governed by the interaction of their requirements, which change as they develop, and the environments that they use, which are rivers, estuaries in the ocean, which are also constantly changing. So um, you can think about this idea of, um, of a habitat filter on the left there, where there's a, a bunch of species, salmon, and maybe some of their life stages that could be found at any one spot in the river. And whether they're there or not depends on these high level climate filters, filters that operate at other scales from the valley to the reach scale down to the microhabitat scale. So they basically, all those conditions have to be met for a salmon to be able to persist, persist there. This is also true of their predators and prey. And you, a lot of the um, actual metrics that you can use to describe these filters are things that can be modified by the water projects. So this is one way of thinking about the impacts as shifting these filters that can then shift the communities and the dynamics that happen at any one place. So that's complicated, but for salmon, it's more complicated because these things have to be coherent in space and time as the, the fish are moving across these landscapes. So another um, useful kind of conceptual model that I'm really fond of is on the right here, which is if you imagine every day, uh, you think of your salmon, what life stage it's at, and you draw on a map where the habitat conditions are that it could persist in, and then you stack those maps in time. So you will end up with a kind of reticulated structure. In this case, it's it's modeled after the vasculature of a fern stem. But so you have this tangled um, structure, which it represents pathways for salmon to move through space and time. And salmon can move through a variety of paths. And salmon biologists love to categorize these paths. They call them life history variants and whatnot. And people, I think, can fall into the trap of thinking each of those as being an adaptation where they really may just be an expression of opportunity. And the real adaptation is being able to take advantage of this dynamic environment. So this is also, I think, a helpful way of thinking about impacts of water projects, because you can imagine them, as we learned yesterday, they're shifting these areas in space and time of where salmon can persist. And you know things like the dams are lopping off huge sections of that structure. And other ones are expanding and contracting over space and time. And this can then preclude or allow the expression of life history diversity within populations, among populations, and across species uh, in really important ways. And this diversity of life history expression is one of the keys to salmon productivity and why uh, natural salmon systems are so productive and resilient and why ones that are heavily impaired 
by uh, human development or not. Okay, so you may uh, think of salmon correctly as something of the Arctic or subarctic. You could think of Chinook salmon and, and maybe the Yukon River as the archetypical system. Why do we even have them in California? It's kind of a surprising thing because we're in a Mediterranean climate. It's hotter than Hades here in the summertime. And uh, the reason is through accidents really of, of ge geography and geology. So our coastal ocean here, those of you who live along the coast are well aware, it's really cold in the summertime, which is a little surprising because similar latitudes on the East Coast, it's really, really warm. And that's because of the California current. It's a subarctic current that comes along the coast. There are uh, coastal upwelling in the spring and summer that keep uh, conditions that are suitable for salmon off our shore most of the time. Not always, there are El Ninos that, that wreck all of that. Um, and that climate condition also generates our weather as well, and which interacts with the incredibly complex topography of California shown on the right. We have the Sierra Nevadas and the Klamath Mountains. The Pacific storms batter into those. That's going to happen today. You'll get to see that. Uh, often, there'll be snowfall that then is stored in those mountains. And it creates conditions that salmon can use uh, in certain times and places throughout central and northern California, in spite of what would generally be an inhospitable climate. So there you can imagine then that there's just an incredible mosaic of, of habitats that range from small mountain streams, gravel bedded, cobble bedded, boulder streams, down through an alluvial valley, which was, you learned, full of uh, huge and productive marshes out to San Francisco Bay and, and the coastal ocean. And salmon in California evolved to take advantage of that. And people systematically have um, altered that for our own needs in ways that are generally, but not always, terrible for salmon. So um, that kind of diversity of habitat opportunity has allowed for um, four different distinct runs of Chinook salmon to exist in California. This does not even exist in the Columbia River. Why is a, a question I've never really seen answered. Why? Well, they don't have winter run Chinook salmon, which is the most endangered one that is really at the heart of um, the wicked problem that we're all learning about. Um, so these, these have been categorized into these four um, kind of species for, for management purposes. They're all part of the same biological species. Um, and they differ according to the timing that there are different life stages and also the locations of where they occur. So I won't go too much into that because we don't have a lot of time. Um, another thing about salmon is that they exist really as populations on a landscape. Um, though that's kind of a fundamental unit because of their propensity to return to where they were born. And uh, we had a, a incredible diversity of salmon populations before uh, the modern era. So Sacramento River Run Chinook, River, Winter Run Chinook existed as four different populations above Lake Shasta. Lake Shasta was installed in the 1940s. It was thought Winter Chinook would go extinct. It is only through the happy accident of it acting like a large spring that Winter Chinook managed to persist to everyone's great surprise. Um, and that works a lot of the time, but not always, which I'll try to talk about a little bit as well. So spring Chinook were much more widely distributed. There were maybe 18 or 20 um, significant populations of those. All but three were extirpated by dams. Um, and the ones that remain are in, in pretty rough shape. Um, so yeah, I should have said here that they're um, either threatened, endangered, or, or a candidate for listing. We do a five-year status review update. Um, I've been involved in these since really their, some of their inceptions. And um, through a, with a bunch of colleagues, we developed a framework for evaluating the viability or extinction risk using some metrics related to IUCN red list criteria. You can trace them back. They have to do with the population size and its trend, whether there have been catastrophic collapses. And the thing we added was whether they're heavily influenced by hatcheries or not. So periodically we do this. And winter Chinook are a weird one because there's just one population left. They, they can't really be delisted under that circumstances. They don't exist in their native range completely. Um, but you can analyze the status of that extant population. And it, it is um, it went through a period of, of um, real recovery. It's kind of a su success story for the Endangered Species Act until the drought uh, really started hammering them. And, and so in 2015, they were starting to decline in their status. And the main response to that has been bolstering the conservation hatchery for those. So that ameliorated a lot of the demographic risks to them, but now they are driven entirely by a hatchery, which is a risk unto itself. Um, spring Chinook generally um, have been declining in status, and we were asked to do an update in 2022. 
and they're all at high risk of extinction now, according to our, our metrics. Uh, they, there's a decision pending on whether they will be moved from threatened to endangered. Stay tuned for that. So, okay, that's um, a crash course in salmon biology. Now I'll talk a little bit about how the water projects affects, affect them. So in preparing for this talk, I was combing through old presentations and realized I gave a talk like this uh, after the 2009 biological opinion, there was also a, an NRC or National Academy panel for that. And I put together this conceptual model. You probably can't really read the boxes, but you'll have the, the slide to look at it. Um, this this has really stood up, I think. Uh, I, I wouldn't change it too much. If I had a little more time, I probably would have a little. But anyway, the, a couple points I want to make with this is um, the effects are complicated and they interact. And um, they're not just about water project operations, and I know that's the focus of this review, but I don't think you can really understand the impacts only looking at the operations. You need to think about the facilities themselves, which have effects on salmon, no matter how you operate them, uh, whether it's a run of the river situation, um, whatever, the dams, the channels changes, uh, and the, the other structures have impacts as well. Now, at the beginning, when people first started worrying about the effects of these projects, the focus was really on entrainment. And this, I think, reflects the fact that we manage what we can measure. And it's easy in fisheries when you have bodies to understand what's going on. So it, uh, another thing we do in my lab is fisheries management. And they bring them on the boat, not all of them. There are other impacts. But it's easy to count, and it's easy to see how fisheries impact salmon. Similarly, entrainment, uh, you have water that's moving across the delta. It has salmon in it. And it ends up at these pumping plants, and some of them were going in the canal, and that clearly was not a great thing. Uh, a lot of attention was put on improving the screening of that, and as they were studying that, they found that for all the fish that are actually, you know, hurt or, or taken in by those pumps, many, many more were never getting there. So if they did a tagging study, they released some fish a little upstream, a lot of them never show up at the pumps, and it, and, um, it became increasingly appreciated that the interior delta itself was a big problem for salmon, regardless really of what the pumps were doing. Um, it has more probably to do with the delta cross channel and whether fish are getting entrained in there. And this has really stood up. A lot of research has been done on this with more advanced tagging and analysis uh, to show that the, the uh, interior delta is a very bad place for salmon to be as they try to migrate through. And this seems to be due to the predators that Louise was talking about. Uh, predation rates are very high and very localized even at, sp at specific places and times. So that uh, remains all true and of interest. What happened in the intervening period was this focus on water quality and the effects of dams on water temperature. You saw a lot about how flows change. Uh, hydrographs uh, are flattened out and evened out. And the same is true of the thermograph. There was a little bit about that yesterday. Um, but the, the river generally now is much colder in the summer than it would have been historically and warmer in the fall and winter, uh, which is generally a good thing for salmon, or, or at least for winter wrench and salmon, which are spawning in the summer. Their eggs are the most sensitive life stage. Um, and we thought we had this under pretty good control with the, the temperature control structure on Shasta Dam and the protection criteria uh, about how cold to keep the river. Uh, but then Ben Martin at our lab at the time, he's now at the University of Amsterdam, uh, dug into this a bit and he analyzed the, so this was all based on laboratory data. You take eggs into, the, into a, a laboratory, and you can rear them under different temperatures and look at their survival. And he fit a model to that on the left, which came up with uh, this idea, well, supporting an idea that about 15 degrees C or colder should be fine for salmon. And that's how the system was operated. And only a few times in the historical record did it get above that. And there were clear consequences, you could see in the data, especially after the 1977 El Nino, when they, the river just got completely hot and the, the, the winter Chinook that were in the river that year all died, essentially. It was thought that was a rare thing. So Ben then refit this model, not from laboratory data, but using the observed survival that you can get from looking at the production of juveniles by the spawning adults and how many you catch at a trap downstream. And using the model that was uh, estimated from lab data is on the left, basically it doesn't explain any of their variability. But if you let that critical temperature parameter be estimated from the field data, you get the fit on the right, which explains a lot of the variability, especially the increasing uh, low survivals in, in recent years during the drought. Um, and this is, he explains this then in, in the paper there as being a consequence of oxygen limitation, really. And in the lab studies, they use high flow rates because, you, you know, it's a lab study. You want to remove all other variables and focus on the temperature. In the field, 
that's not the case. The actual velocities within salmon reds are lower than that. And looking at estimates in the literature on that, he basically came up with the conclusion that's what's driving this discrepancy. This led, at least in part, to a reinitiation of consultation on the opinion that we were still kind of, I think, sorting out. Uh, but the temperature criteria is now lower. OK. Um, the water projects aren't the only other thing going on. I was asked, I think, to say something about the other stressors. Climate change is a huge one. The drying and warming of California's climate is bad for salmon. Salmon like it cold and wet. And this is not the, pro the fault of the water projects, but it's also a challenge for the water projects. And the interaction of the two is an increasingly big issue for salmon. Um, there are a lot of other changes in the ecosystem, some successes of conservation, recovery of things like the California sea lion. These things eat enormous numbers of salmon. And we don't really have a way yet of managing that very effectively. Uh, fisheries, of course, are um, often an issue, although uh, they were closed this last season because of drought impacts. Uh, there are things like diseases, which are also somewhat related to water project operations as well. Uh, I didn't even really mention it, mention the pesticides, which may be related to the fact that you can irrigate agriculture. And then a really thing out of left field that's come up uh, that we're studying intensively at our lab is this emerging thymine deficiency, which is uh, driven by eating a lot of anchovies, which are at record high levels. They produce an enzyme which destroys thymine. The adult salmon seem to be OK maybe with that, but their offspring basically die. There's a picture of them. Uh, they hatch out, and they just flop over and die, uh, unless they're treated. So that's one of the things that we've been working on. That raises a host of issues itself. So I just want to finish up with a slightly uh, on a tangent here with another conceptual model. This was something I developed in response to the, the first time the salmon fishery was ever closed back in 2007 and 8, when uh, we had a record low level of escapement. And um, at the time, a lot of people wanted to blame that on the water projects. We did a careful assessment of all of the data on this. It turns out in that case, it really was something going on in the ocean, delay and upwelling. That was the proximate cause. But the system had experienced that in the past, but it seems much more vulnerable to a catastrophic response now, which we think is due to the increasing reliance on hatchery production and the narrowing of the diversity. So basically, almost all the fish arrive at the ocean at the same time. And if the ocean is bad, then they're in a lot of trouble. Where if they were spread out, you know, some that would have got there later would have been fine. And the ones that were there earlier did OK. So. I put this little model together at that time, thinking about these systems in general. They have a, a decline in natural production related to human development. The universal response to that is, at some point, we need to build hatcheries to mitigate that. And those work for a while, but they, there's clear evidence that they suppress the natural productivity and fitness of salmon. Um, so we have that decline in the middle graph. And this is then interacting with a climate effect, which is both the amplification of climate variability and the sensitivity of salmon populations to that because of this constrained life history diversity. When you add all that up, you get the picture at the bottom. And this, is, mind you, is just a cartoon, really. And I made this figure where we were at time point one there. And I basically predicted this cat catastrophe will go away and we will be back to something that looks pretty good, but it's going to get even worse after that. And the data actually then are on the right. And it's kind of bizarre that it almost looks like the cartoon. And the, the point of all of this is this is not a sustainable situation. If we keep operating everything and doing everything the way that we are right now, salmon, they're going to go extinct, but they're just going down. We need to find ways to reverse some of these trends, the decline, in particular in the decline in natural productivity and fitness of wild salmon and their sensitivity to the the climate. And that has to do with finding ways of restoring that reticulated structure of habitat and space and time. And um, that's what I'm urging us to all think about is how, how can we reconcile the needs of salmon, which need that kind of dynamic environment, with the needs of people who are used to trying to control environmental, environmental variability as much as possible for their own needs. And I think this is a really challenging thing to reconcile. And I I'm really looking forward to some good ideas about that. So thank you very much.
morning, everybody. Uh, I want to start by thanking my colleagues at Reclamation for the invitation to be here and thanking the panel for the same. Uh, I've been asked to kind of overview the biology of the two um, listed and in one case nearly listed from the federal perspective anyway, uh, Osmerid smelts in the San Francisco estuary. Um, this is going to be pretty simple and straightforward. I'm just intending it to be a reference that the panel can use to kind of compare and contrast among the two. Um, and, and, and it's based on things that are not readily synthesizable, I guess, out of the voluminous literature, especially for Delta smelt. I'm sure that my computer hard drive has 200 papers that have something to say about one or both of these fish. So not even counting gray literature. So some basics. The long fin smelt is native to the San Francisco estuary, but it's not constrained to it. It's part of a species complex that uh, spans from here to Alaska. The Delta smelt is endemic to the San Francisco estuary. It presumably evolved um, from Eastern Pacific surf smelt. Well, that part's known, that's not presumable, but presumably evolved along with the estuary in the last 10 or 15,000 years, as Ted had talked about. Uh, from a federal perspective, the longfin smelt is currently proposed to be an endangered species that hasn't finalized, but probably will sometime this year. Delta smelt is officially threatened, has been since 1993, but it's conservation reliant at this point, and I will show the panel what that means specifically later in the talk. Uh, neither one of these is a big fish, but longfin smelt is bigger. Because it's bigger, presumably it produces more eggs, so higher fecundity. There is um, possibly a little ghost of competition past for the Joe Connell fans in the audience uh, in their spawning, in that the longfin smelt spawns earlier in the year. It's mainly in the winter. Delta smelts mainly in the spring. And the longfin spawning is somewhat seaward of the delta smelt center of spawning. Those aren't absolutes, but they're suitable generalities. Um, longfin smelts not only bigger, it has a bigger mouth, so it eats bigger prey. Uh, salt tolerance is higher in longfin smelt. It's not confined to the estuary, um, but if it does leave, it may not come back. Um, Delta smelt is confined to the estuary. It, it can't really take seawater except in a laboratory where you do things just right. Um, temperature tolerance, however, of longfin smelt is lower and more in line with what Steve just uh, described for salmon. Delta smelt can do a little better with warmer water. I mentioned neither of these is a, a, a giant in the fish world. Uh, a really big long fin smelt is 125 millimeters or about five inches long. Uh, a really big delta smelt is not even four inches long, uh, generally speaking. So these are, um, as far as we know, historically in the ecology of the system, they were little pelagic forage fishes. So offshore oriented food for, for bigger things. Um, Pelagic in, in, the, in the use of it for this estuary doesn't mean what it does in the ocean, um, where you're talking about a swordfish or a white shark that swims thousands of miles a year. Uh, we just mean it generally offshore, away from the shoreline. And this is a, a silly plot <laughs> that I made for this talk just to make this point, because it does get debated. Um, so there's a bunch of studies from the literature, I can provide them if, if people want them that are ordered on the x-axis, depending on how old they are. Um, and studies that I've colored green used offshore sampling gears like trawls or fish salvage in the case of the far most left one. And the ones that are colored brown were nearshore things like seines. And so um, things like Mississippi silverside, largemouth bass, if you're in fresh water, you see the big dots. That's their relative abundance relative to these four fish. Tends to be in the brown colored nearshore stuff and the smelts, if they're gonna poke their head up and be somewhat abundant are gonna be that way offshore. So that is their predominant habitat <clears throat> for the most part. So getting into life cycle basics, hopefully everybody can kind of keep a map in mind. These species uh, being pelagic, uh, do redistribute a fair bit. The low salinity zone is an important part of their habitat, and that can, when it's really wet, be in San Pablo Bay, pretty uh, close, you know, to the what you typically think of as a marine environment. 
uh, or in low flow, it can get into the river channels of the delta. So meaningful maximum age of longfin smelts too. I'm sure there's a three-year-old around here and there, but two. Um, for delta smelt, pretty much annual. Uh, I mentioned the, the earlier spawning um, hatch success in a lab for longfin smelt starts to decline at 15 Celsius um, and seems to shut off pretty much for delta smelt at 20, but they can probably, but the culture facility likes to keep things at 16, which would not be good for longfin smelt, but works just fine for delta smelt. So there's definitely some temperature difference there. They're both presumed to spawn on sandy substrates or maybe even small cobbly type substrates. If any of that exists in the estuary, they have little tiny demersal eggs that will smother if they're on fine substrate. So they need to find something that won't smother them. Um, Longfin smelts larvae are pelagic and mostly in the low salinity zone. That's not, none, none of these things are intended to be 100% and people will argue every little thing I say probably. So uh, just keep in mind, we're speaking about a mode in a statistical distribution. Uh, Delta smelts larvae are um, likewise pelagic, but mostly landward of what we think of as the low salinity zone. So they're in, they're in where the tide is, but they're in the Delta and freshwater when they're very low. Um, juveniles then, the longfin smelt start to move seaward, presumably in part at least to avoid warmer water as the season progresses. And because they don't have any trouble dealing with higher salinity, they move that way. Delta smelt moved down into the low salinity zone, uh, and that's about as far as they seem to be able to go. And then they do their best to deal with the summertime. In the fall, the longfin smelts start to come back in, and they will reoccupy the low salinity zone and other places. Um, and the delta smelt mostly stay there until it really starts to rain, and then they'll move back into the tidal freshwater. So that's kind of the two life cycles superimposed on each other. Um, before I get into status type things, which is going to be my my next slide, you know, the speakers have done a great job of pointing out that the system has changed a lot, and this is one more expression of that. <laughs> um, so the x-axis on this little timeline is year since 1850 to today, and then a few things on the y-axis that are our major um, changes to the system, and you can kind of see how they line up in time. So um, I don't know that I need to get big into any of that. It's there for your reference if you want. Um, I think given the given time constraints and how you've heard this over and over, I can just let it be right there. So um, we'll move into the time series that we have of abundance for these species. This is uh, CDFW's fall midwater trawl data. That's a survey that's been going pretty continuously since 1967. So it's getting close to 60 years as a time series. Um, Usually you will see these as bar graphs. I prefer to plot them this way for a couple of reasons. One, I can plot both species. The y-axis here doesn't mean anything. It's just there to separate the two. So I could put pretty pictures of the fish alongside them. The index is a relative abundance index only. So numbers are nothing but a distraction. The bubble size is the index. So with long fin smelt, you can see pretty dramatic decline over time. Uh, if you can try to reconjure the image that Louise had of the flow water year types that have occurred over time. There was a wet series at the beginning. There was a wet series in the early 1980s, and there was a wet series in the middle and late 1990s, and there hasn't been one since. So this is mostly an age zero index, uh, meaning a first year production index. It's not showing you what's happening with the adult stock, but when when the fish lives two years tops, that adult stock is declining. And after 20 years of non-consecutive wet years, there's not going to be as many adults, and they're not going to be able to produce the egg supply that they did in 1967. Um, in addition, Louise mentioned the overbite clam, which uh, is most people's best guess for why the 1990s rebound was rather modest compared to the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, undoubtedly, the panel is going to hear at some point that the flow relationship for long fin smelt is declining. Um, it is if you ignore fish population dynamics. Uh, that's what's shown in gray bars in this plot. 
So um, the x-axis is just how many years since 1967 are included in a linear regression of some flow variable. It doesn't really matter if you use outflow averaged over this, that, or the other, or x2 over this, that, or the other. They're all pretty collinear and do the same thing versus the index. If that's all you do, then yes, the relationship is losing explanatory power pretty badly through time. But if you even make the simplest attempt to account for the egg supply effect, um, it isn't. And so that's what I've done here. This figure actually comes out of our species status assessment for long fin smelt. Um, is it exactly right? No, it's an approximation. Is a linear regression a good way to do a population dynamic analysis? No. But if a simple model will make a simple point, let's, you know, that's, that's all I want to say about that, I think. Okay, delta smelt. So delta smelt, um, not as abundant as long fin smelt ever in this time series. I, nobody knows historically <laughs> beyond that. Um, probably never really was because it didn't have access to marine waters. And usually things that can get to a marine environment are going to experience more overall productivity. But um, yeah, a relatively rare fish the entire time we've been uh, studying it. I wrote a, a paper about that in San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science that's pretty controversial a couple of years ago. You um, can read it if you like. But importantly for what I want to get to next is that the Fall Midwater Trawl Index um, has been zero for Delta smelt since 2018. And this goes through 2023, so that's six years running that it's been zero. Um, and in response to that index starting to get so small that it didn't really tell people very much from year to year, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, decided to put monitoring on steroids for delta smelt and do their do what's called the Enhanced Delta Smelt Monitoring Program, which is sampling pretty substantially. It's a humongous field effort every week of the year. Um, and this is the data, at least through last October, from that study. So you have week, so basically time within a year on the x-axis here, abundance estimates on the y-axis that are just density expansions. And then each panel is a year, starting with 2016. So in 2018, which is the third panel down, that's the start of the fall midwater trawl, uh, suggesting delta smelt are below the uh, threshold for that survey to detect them anyway, but they're clearly still around because the enhanced delta smelt monitoring program, which trawls right at the surface, best technique we have for detecting delta smelt, showed that they could catch them most weeks. Um, but you can see that you can get zeros even when your previous week's abundance estimate was 100,000 fish or something like that. So um, the San Francisco estuary is a big place. These fish are small. They're presumably aggregated into shoals. Uh, so you get that kind of thing when you do enough of it. Um, and you can see that that you know, the survey kept detecting, kept detecting, and then you get down to the third from the bottom panel, 2021, and now things are looking pretty bleak, even with this intense sampling. And that seemed to really motivate folks to um, change their tune about supplementing the population. That had been discussed for years. It hadn't been done. There were permitting hurdles. There were all kinds of things going on. But in the winter of 2022, which is 2020, the tail end of a 2021 cohort, we put experimental fish out, about 50,000 or 60,000. I don't remember the exact number. And lo and behold, the next uh, spring, we detected fish at a higher level than they had been detected the year before. Now, we don't have the genetics to prove that that was the supplementation that did it, but if anybody would like to bet against me, I'll go ahead and take it, because um, we did it again in 2022 and saw the same pattern, and we're doing it again right now, and EDSM is catching delta smell. So um, I think this survey has been super duper important, not only for showing that the species wasn't gone, but for showing that at least in principle, even at an experimental release level, um, we're going to be able to see the response of that in the population. And that's, that's um, I guess, the most 
hopeful conservation thing I've seen in 30 years of Delta smelt stuff. So um, thank you, Kerrigan, for talking about the ESA yesterday. Now I don't really have to. I will only thing I want to say about this slide is that long fin smelt is in that top part of this sort of what you do through time with ESA flow chart and Delta smelt has been in that bottom part for a long time. So I was asked to talk a little bit about smelts and ESA, so I'm gonna do that. We're back to this timeline figure. When we do a consultation, like the one you were asked to review from what we did in 2019, what we're doing again right now, there's an environmental baseline. And that environmental baseline is everything that ever happened, which this is kind of a conceptualization of, but it's not what we're consulting on. It's there, we have to accept that it happened and that that's maybe part of the reason or all of the reason that the species is where it is, but it's not what we're consulting on. What we're consulting on is what Reclamation and DWR are proposing to do. Um, and there is more to it than flows, obviously, um, but in terms of what they do that affects pelagic fish in the estuary, flows are a major part of that. And so um, this is kind of just a schematic of what the major ones are. So OMR, uh, as somebody, maybe Josh pointed out, is a tidal construct in the South Delta. Correct. It's a tidal construct in which the flood tide flows more strongly towards the pumps because they're pumping water and the ebb tide doesn't go as far. And so as Lenny uh, did with interpretive dance yesterday, the uh, net effect is what net flow is reflecting and it if you're plankton or if you're a fish that's trying to tide surf to go look for a place to spawn you have a high probability of, of going towards the pumps if you get into old middle river so that is something we think about when we're thinking about project operations for that reason another thing we think about um, is x2 location and that's because the low salinity zone is important habitat to these fish, but it's also because it doesn't function the same way everywhere. Um, when it gets out into Sassoon Bay, which is, these are, you know, these kilometer locations that are shown here are mostly things that come out of the state board's D1641 regulation, depending on how wet or dry it is in the winter and spring, will affect which one of these uh, the projects are, are trying to meet. Um, it gets out into mixes of deeper and shallower habitat. Um, the, the greater amount of fresh water that's flowing over the salt water that's coming in will intensify vertical mixing and different kinds of currents that help retain sediment, which these fish hide in, plankton, which these fish eat, and uh, especially for the larvae, maybe the fish themselves. So long fin smelt having a center of distribution as larvae very near X2 suggests that they aren't really doing much except letting aggregation happen because that's also where sediment peaks have historically been and planktonic organism peaks have been. Delta smelt, because it's upstream of that, must have some different behaviors or it would be in the same place. I don't know what they are, but, um, but that's kind of the nutshell there and why we why we pay attention to that. And then since the 2019 opinion, um, which had a new thing, a summer use of the Sassoon Marsh Salinity Control Gate in an attempt to help Delta smelt survive the summer by putting them into a relatively productive place or coax them there, I guess, by lowering the salinity of it. Uh, that's another essentially flow, um, flow mechanism that we are now paying attention to. And so one, one last thought about uh, water project operations and adaptive management, which the agencies have heard for a long time and tried to implement for a long time. It, it does. It, I mean, if I, I'm a lumper, there's lumpers and splitters, right? I'm a lumper. So I'm going to call almost anything adaptive management if people are trying. Um, and that's how I'm going to characterize this. But the real world's sloppy. There's differences of opinion. There's litigation. There's politics, administration changes, all of that superimposes on top of any scientific effort. Um, and then there's the time it takes for a scientific effort. So in 1993, after the Delta smelt was listed, either the 93 or the 95 biological opinion for Delta smelt basically said, 
avoid jeopardy by implementing what became D1641. And I imagine that, you know, that Bay Delta Accord had already kind of been worked out. Everybody was on board with it, but that's part of where that comes from. Then in te, uh, Ted Summer yesterday mentioned the pelagic organism decline. That was a catalyst to reinitiate. Um, it also ended up being a catalyst to change uh, what we were doing from an entrainment perspective to OMR management, because that was a newer way of thinking about it. Uh, it catalyzed a look at a fall X2 that's been nothing but contentious and um, problematic because of the, the mega drought that we've uh, experienced that we didn't recognize at the time. Uh, tidal habitat restoration also came out of that. And then when we got far enough into the mega drought to understand what was going on, that catalyzed reinitiation in part because Delta smelt was almost gone by that point. So the, the 2019 opinion then had the, so the experimental release effort and uh, also the Sassoon Marsh Gate summertime action that I just mentioned. So anyway, I think point being, I think that there has been some adaptive management. There has been attempts to try pretty significant flow experiments um, and we have learned from them and we're continuing to learn from them. So that's basically what I wanna say about that. Um, like everybody, I didn't do this talk by myself. I had a lot of help from my Fish and Wildlife Service colleagues, both in my office and in Lodi. Um, I also had some help from CDFW's Stockton uh, folks. And um, I do also want to give a shout out to the field crews who do these intensive monitoring programs. They're out in the cruddy weather. Um, well, old guys like me uh, stand here in climate controlled. <laughs> climate controlled circumstances and pretend like this is their stuff um, as well. Well, thank you. Those were three great uh, presentations and uh, we do have about 15 minutes. So I'd like to uh, open the floor to members from the committee. And uh, Rene, should we start with you and then go to Patrick? Um, joking earlier, this is like game show vibes. I just thank you all so much. I, uh, yeah, just uh, having known you all for a while, I just uh, am increasingly grateful that I get to talk about things that I care about. Um, Matt, I'm curious, I kind of have two, two part question. One is I'm curious if you could paint a picture for us of the kind of behavior, you know, opinion and mind of the sense like, what did the Delta smelt recovery look like and how did it look like right before we started pumping water into the Bay Delta? things around the cloud fix the mechanism for their decline in the first place. And uh, so I guess I'm wondering what's, what's the long game for those supplementations and what do we hope will change that will allow those populations to fare better that we don't know naturally in the Bay Delta or the Bay Delta Sea. You might have to turn on the mic. All right, is that on? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think I want to start with the second one. Um, I see experimental release and supplementation efforts as the latest or one of the latest um, adaptive management experiments. Um, you know, what will happen over time, we'll have to see. Um, lots of people have tried to predict the future and been wrong about it. <laughs> um, other people have 
done better about it. But um, so I, I imagine that's not a very satisfactory answer, but it's the one that I, I think I have right now. It's the beginning of another adaptive management experiment. Um, as for the historical system, I guess I would point the panel to a couple of papers that um, looked, did their, did their best to recreate the pre-gold rush landscape in a three-dimensional hydrodynamic model and then the flow regime. Um, one of them is by somebody, Andrews and Ed Gross, and the other one's by Ed Gross uh, as first author. But those are pretty interesting things to think about from the fish ecology, obviously. So um, the natural flow regime that longfin smelt would have experienced would have fairly frequently put X2 in San Pablo Bay during their reproduct and, reproductive and rearing system or uh, reproductive and rearing season, um, maybe even 50% of the time if my... Uh, recollection is correct and which is enough for a two-year fish in theory um that doesn't happen very often anymore so that's a, a pretty significant change that the species has been trying to deal with um and then delta smelt is much more speculative i i personally don't think it was a crazy abundant fish I think it it was in the river channels, the tidal river channels in low salinity, eastward of a lot of the plankton feeding fish biomass, like anchovies and herrings and longfin smelt that was more marine. Um, I'm confident it was getting a humongous food subsidy out of the tidal marshes that Louise showed have been taken away just because of the scale of open water to marsh at the time was so <laughs> different. Um, so I imagine that that, that has been a, a pretty significant change for them. Um, but those are just a couple of, of opinions like you asked for, so. Okay, thanks. One quick comment. I'm going to give everybody handheld mics because we're getting feedback, but the Zoom cannot hear either the speakers or the Perfect. questions from the committee members, so. Okay, well, well thank, thanks a lot. And let's go to Patrick next. <clears throat> I was all set to use that. Is that working any better? I think if you hold it to your mouth, that'll just be a lot better. Okay, we'll give it a try. Thanks. <laughs> Speak loudly. Speak loudly. That's a problem for me. Okay. Thanks for the presentations. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, and we've been getting a lot of information. Um, so uh, uh, let me focus on the, the smelt element of it. Um, and. I'm going to throw out a few things and they're a little bit jumbled and I'm really what I'm getting at is, you know, what do we do about the smelt, especially the Delta smelt. And, um, uh, in, in that context, uh, on the East coast, working in the Hudson river estuary and, and along the Atlantic, we're seeing fish move. I uh, saw, so I have a big model that, that predicts where, uh, summer flounder are going to be in the future based on climate change and so on and so forth. Also been working on uh, establishing corridors uh, in the terrestrial system uh, so that uh, organisms can move to adapt to the changes in temperature that are going on. Uh, one of the hard parts about, uh, about fish is like looking at lakes in uh, upstate New York. Uh, the lake trout are going away and they're being replaced by bass. But fish can't leave the lake. So, uh, so they're basically, they're basically going away. And, and the other thing that we've noticed with the whole climate change thing, and I'm glad you guys are looking at it, is that climate affects different parts of the life history in different ways. And, and uh, I, I, you know, I think we, uh, we're, we're sort of recognizing that here, which I appreciate, and Steve mentioned it and so forth too. So, um, my uh, question I put into our, our, our group yesterday was, you know, what's what's the smoking gun or guns <laughs> for the Delta smelt? And, um, you know, you uh, uh, Matt, you put up the, the sort of phase of things going on. And, and for me, I mean, you, you seem to have a long time series 
you know, the fish are relatively low through throughout that time series. But uh, it would seem to me that seeing what would happen, like in a quantitative way, all the way through there, would give us insight as to what was uh, most dramatic in terms of impact and what was less, so that when we come down to right now and we're just managing water, uh, should should there be other things? And this is uh, part of what I'm feeling in a lot of the presentations that were being given is we're seeing this. You know, we we heard from uh, uh, from Steve on this. Uh, we're looking at temperature, but maybe it's oxygen. We look at oxygen, but maybe it's oxygen and temperature together, or maybe it's oxygen temperature and flow, or maybe it's oxygen temperature and habitat, or maybe it's habitat affecting the eggs and then temperature affecting the reproductive quantity of the fish and so on. So I'm, I guess I'm asking, are there models out there for all of this kind of stuff? And if so, can we see them? Uh, uh, because it would seem that are really sort of integrated when we were talking about synthesis. Uh, 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 Louise, even you, you were kind of listing all of these things, which I really valued seeing, but I didn't see any connection between any of them. I mean, we can kind of intuitively believe that, you know, the invasive plant's doing something, but what exactly is it doing and how is it affecting it? And uh, this was raised by Oppenheimer yesterday too uh, about, you know, uh, can we look at it in sort of integrated way? So I'm just kind of, I'm sorry, that's a sort of a jumble of a whole bunch of things, but my brain goes, do we have a model of all of this pulling, pulling at least some or, or maybe most of it together in some sense? So thank you. Oh, that's still on, perfect. Um, thank you, Patrick. So four long pins melt at the moment there are variations of, of models like the regression one that I showed you. There's pretty simple statistical correlation, uh, devils in the details. So how much, you know, flow is flow in one month is correlated to the next month, the next month, the next month. And so what they require really isn't known. Um, seems to be, you know, tons and tons climatic sort of flow. Um, but beyond that, Nobody's too sure. Um, the service, the Fish and Wildlife Service has recently been funded, I believe, by DWR to, de to develop a life cycle model for longfin smelt as best we can from available data. So that's just getting underway. It's a couple years out. Uh, Delta smelt is a whole nother, th it's arguably the best studied endangered fish in the country. Um, and I think, depending on your tolerance for what constitutes a life cycle model, there's at least four published life cycle models, maybe six. Um, they are generally statistical, but Kenny Rose's is agent-based or individual-based. Um, and then there's unpublished amalgams and variants on those as well that have been used in some other you know, planning efforts recently. So, so yeah, there is, there is, I can, I can send you those if you'd like to see them. Um, yeah. yeah that, thanks Matt. And we, <clears throat> we will be focusing on modeling and the next meeting, but I just wondered if Steve or Louise wanted to add to the question about mo models from your species perspective. Yeah, sure. I, I can talk about that. Uh, for salmon, um, they probably rival delta smelt in terms of how much we know about them, especially winter run chinook salmon. We have a very detailed full life cycle model for winter chinook that can connect climate, water project operations, habitat, uh, all the way through to the population level. And it does actually even have some of the kind of dynamics I was talking about, about the, the shifting mosaic of habitats, floodplain inundation and, and things like that. It has fisheries. Um, and it's been used in the last couple uh, biological opinions, uh, I think, pretty pretty successfully. And what it tell it tells us a, a lot putting a model like that together. And one of the, the kind of the strange things about winter run chinook that I don't really understand ultimately what's going on is their productivity is low, even when everything is good and they're growing. It's they don't grow that fast compared to what Pacific salmon populations are able to do. Uh, and I, we don't really know why. It could have something to do with um, this fry stage, which we. Kathy Marcinkevich alluded to yesterday, it's an important part of the life cycle, too small to put tags in. So we don't we don't really know. We know where they are and when, but we don't know anything about their survival. Um, 
And in spite of like uh, we have good information about the the egg survival, and this was alluded to yesterday, you can explain a lot of the variation due to temperature, but there's still a lot of other what's called background mortality. We don't know what causes that. It, it seems high compared to a lot of other populations. That's part of the productivity issue as well. But the, yeah, the models are indispensable for understanding and, and guiding the management. And we're in relatively good shape for winter and Chinook, less so for the other other salmon. Uh, Louise, anything to add? I, I don't think so. I think the main point is there are life cycle models and hopefully that can be a part of the focus at the next uh, meeting for the panel. I think it sounds important. For... That's right. And so the last question <clears throat> before the break, we go to Albert. And uh, I know there's a lot of other questions here. So during the break, it will be, be an opportunity to check in with the speakers. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for these interesting presentations. I have a question on the topic of flow abundance relationships. Uh, I think we saw some parallels across presentations uh, on this idea that maybe interannual variation in flow uh, seems to be less important now than it used to, uh, in the sense that maybe wet years are helping uh, less and less. And I've been working on this topic, and I, I'm interested in your thoughts about whether you think this is real and maybe uh, driven by demographics, maybe populations are reaching, especially for these listed species um, and complexes, maybe they're reaching a, a size where it's hard for them to bounce back, uh, even if there's a, a good year. Uh, or to what extent you think that it may be a product of the tools we are using, which in many cases uh, assume a stationarity and, uh, or, you know, like you just average uh, a long time series. And even if you keep, you uh, know, cutting it later and later, uh, you know, hoping to, to get at this time varying relationship, uh, it's maybe still not, you know, the, the way to go about it. So my question is, do you think it's real or should we be embracing other modeling tools that maybe uh, do not assume a single flow of abundance relationship, but maybe multiple ones depending on your context or the like? <laughs> I'll take a stab at it too, but you go first. Okay, because the one I can think of that's best is the salmon one. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> um, so, hmm. for longfin smelt, yes, I believe low abundance relationship is real. Um, and as several people have pointed out, the wet years are really spread out for the past 20 or more years now, 25 years, which is a long time for a, a fish that lives one or two years to, to go without <laughs> a serious population rebuilding. You know, multiple wet years in a row or nearly in a row uh, hasn't really happened since the 1990s. And so I, I, I don't know that the underlying relationship for longfin has changed. I think that they're, you know, what we're not monitoring is is adults and their egg supply and how much that has to have declined. And so it looks like something's changed, but I don't know that anything necessarily mathematically had to change. It's it's just that you're missing what seems like usually in fisheries population dynamics is a pretty foundational piece of information. How many adults do you have and what's their egg supply? Um, so yeah, I mean, my personal opinion is it probably hasn't changed. What's changed is the weather. Um, Delta smelt I do think has changed, but this is very opinion based. I, I think that prior to 2000 or so, my personal opinion is the major limit on delta smelt was a carrying capacity imposed on them by striped bass. Um, and that could lessen or tighten depending on environmental conditions. But after striped bass had declined enough and the delta started changing, what seems to have emerged from our life cycle modeling, my, my team's life cycle modeling is that flow in the summer which is artificially elevated over what it ever was, is now the big driver. Um, and we don't agree even within my team about why. So I think I'm just not gonna say anything about it here because I, I don't wanna over, overtake the fact that I have the microphone right now. So. <laughs> So for, for salmon, I think flow abundance relationships are very real. We have uh, direct 
observations now of, of uh, survival of smolts as they relate to flow. And when it's uh, the flows are high, they have tenfold higher survival, I think, compared to the lowest flows. And that has something to do with their exposure to predators. It is hard to tease apart, though, because when we have high flow conditions, those are usually cold as well. So there are probably conflated temperature effects. Um, in terms of like a, a changing, a non-stationary relationship, the one compelling bit of evidence I've seen there is the response at the population level of Chinook salmon in the San Joaquin River tributaries, which used to have, they still exhibit a relationship to flow. You get a lot more fish a couple of years after the flows are high, but the slope of that regression seems to have changed over the last decade and a half. And the suspicion is it may be reflecting uh, the influences of hatcheries, which are the source of much of the fish that go in there. And they, they just seem to be less productive, all else equal than they used to, which is what's predicted from domestication selection. It's not, that's not been proved, but it's consistent with that. Um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Anything to add, please? I'm, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. And with that, I'm going to bring this <clears throat> session to um, you know, a close. And before thanking the speakers, I would like to just mention that the open mic session, um, we've had several sign-ups. If you haven't and you're in the room and you wish to uh, address the committee, please sign up on the back sheet. Uh, for those of you that have signed up, um, it'll be about five minutes each, so please keep your remarks to about five minutes or I'll have to cut, cut you off. And we'll deal with the in-person people before lunch, we hope, and then we'll take lunch and we'll come back for the people who've signed up online uh, through Zoom. So with that, I'll draw this session to a close, but I would like to thank again, as we saw yesterday, really the leaders uh, behind the science and the ecology for being here today. We know you've got a lot of other pressures right now. So uh, let's uh, give a hand to the speakers for such a great. And we'll come back at 10.45.
something in the air in this room with you. Dry air. Uh, no, I'm just seven two years. Sorry. Okay. Well, welcome back. And uh, climate change has obviously been a theme in every session so far. And I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Mike Anderson, who serves as a state climatologist for California. This is a collaborative position between the state and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration to provide climate data services for the state. A state climatologist, Dr. Anderson has managed the Atmospheric River Research Program, and we'd like to thank you for bringing one today with you. Um, <laughs> um, and he works extensively with the academic community and local and federal agencies to improve the understanding of these key contributors to flood events in California. He has contributed to the state's climate change assessments, which are widely used as a model in many other states, uh, and has provided guidance to the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan since its inception in 2012. Currently, Dr. Anderson works in the executive division of the Department of Water Resources, providing technical knowledge and advice for climate resilient resources management in a changing climate. Dr. Anderson. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, try and work through this and see if we can tell the tale of mostly the Delta watershed to some degree, broader uh landscapes to understand how we got to where we're at and where we're going next all righty let's there we go uh so anyway we'll start with some key climate features in the region including some geography because the landscape is really important and we'll get to recent events uh, extremes in water and fire and then we'll talk about the climate change narrative and how it fits into guiding our expectations into how things are evolving. But one of the things I want to focus on here are looking at both time and space scales, both in how we measure things and how things evolve, and try and help understand how that fits within the context of how we live and work in this environment. So. We'll see if I'm successful in that regard. All right, so let's start with water year because this is really important because we have a really cool way of how our year works hydrologically. We start in the fall. Uh, we have a nice long dry summer. And with fall, on average, October 1 up in Crescent City, right at the border with Oregon, fall precip onset starts there. On average, Fall precip onsets at San Diego is Halloween. So the month of October generally is when the water year starts. We see fall precip onset. Now, sometimes that gets delayed into November. Now, as we're moving from October to November, remember geophysically, the earth is tilting back. Our days are getting shorter. Sun angles getting lower. This is really important to understand the landscape that's been dry, waiting for those first rains to get wet warm enough to be wet before the days get short enough, cold enough at elevation for snow. So that's why that temperature anomaly is really important as we progress through the fall season. And all of that goes to speak to what's the state of the soil moisture when the snowpack begins to initiate. And part of that is dependent on the geology that underlies that because the, north, the southern Cascades in the very northern part of the state is a very different geology than the Sierra Nevada, which is mostly a granitic uh, fractured rock environment. Now we get into winter, and this is where things get really exciting. 90 days, December, January, February. Half our annual precip on average shows up in this 90-day window. It doesn't happen nice and evenly, though we tend to get punctuated events, and we'll get into those. They're called atmospheric rivers. 
that deliver 40 to 60% of our annual precip comes from these big storms. Well, okay, so we fit those in in a 90 day window and then there's a paper in 2011 by Mike Dettinger kind of digging into this and he showed that really it's about 14 to 21 days out of those 90 days that are the active days. In between it's dry. Now again, seasonally we think about it, right? We've gotten cooler, we're into the cold, we're into the sleep of winter when it's cold. As though some of us might have noticed over the past week, not so cold. Temperatures in the 70s and even in the 60s up in the Sierra. Very non-winter-like. Um, get into spring. This is, gets exciting, right? Because we had our 90-day window, right? Did we get it or did we not? Well, if we didn't, there's always the March miracle, right? We had one year. March of 91. Half the year's precip showed up in that month. And being the fifth year of a drought, it was very thankful that that showed up that year and really changed the tale. It also kind of set the stage that there's always that chance in March. One last chance, right, before we get to April 1. Why April 1? April 1 historically has been the peak of the snowpack building season. So we're now we're pivoting out of the wet season. We're starting into the dry season. Sun angle now is growing again, right, getting up high enough. We're getting enough radiation onto the snowpack to enable it to transition into a melt state and begin to melt as the days get longer temperatures get warmer. So do we get that late season precip bailout last bit? Other important element, do we get that spring precip that helps move the melt and support it? It's only 10% of the water year budget, but it's a really important 10%, just as that first fall onset really important for it to show up and have the right timing. Um, then we get into summer and this is a really exciting time. You'll say, why? It's just hot and dry. Well, it's how it's hot and dry that's really important because that guides how the water moves out of the highlands in the lowlands, how the lowlands begin consuming water and how the landscape begins to dry out, how we become the golden state. We go from the green of winter into the golden brown of summer. Well, there's a little side effect to the golden brown of summer as the landscape really dries out. And it tends to be if you have some convective activity along the crust of the Sierra associated with the North American monsoon, and you don't have enough moisture for rain, but you get lightning and dry vegetation. They don't go so well together. Uh, tends to have fires. Humans interacting with dry vegetation also tends to have some problems. Uh, so we worry about how fast that dries out. What scale is it happening at? And understanding then those heat events, punctuated heat events. Now, used to be, well, hey, it may or may not have a heat event this year. Uh, we're finding more and more that there will be one. It's just when and how big and how long. And so really understanding those heat events. And then the past couple of years, we've been introduced into something a little more frequently than we've seen in the past. And this is some tropical activity. Now, in August and September, the winds in the circulation of the middle latitudes, they, they tend to kind of slacken. And this enables then hurricanes that would either out of the East Pacific that move either out towards Hawaii or off into uh, the Four Corners region to wander up Baja. Past couple of years, they've gotten far enough that they impact Southern California. So we had Tropical Storm K and Tropical Storm Hillary. Now this is really interesting with the circulation of a hurricane and their position such that they make the desert side of the mountains in Southern California windward slopes. And that orographic precip is really important. It defines a lot of how we are in California. Now, we get to the end of the water year, right? Yay, hey, we got there waiting for those fall rains to kick in. And we understand how we set up our water management around this scheme. Now, we all get to April 1, there isn't enough snowpack, kind of dry. What is the first question you often hear? Well, what's next year going to be like? Well, that would be awesome. But I'm here to tell you that... We struggle to get a 90-day outlook pretty good. 
So looking ahead a year ahead, it would be awesome. Yes. Uh, not quite there yet. But now we're going to throw in another twist for you. This last decade did not look like the one before it, noticeably. And the question is, well, then how much different is the next decade going to be? And how do we fold that in to help shape our expectations? Because it's not just, hey, by the time we get to mid-century, hey, we'll deal with that. And when we get to the end of century, hey, we'll deal with that then. It is a really interesting progression along the way that's going to drive things. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So anyway, topography, really important. We've talked a little bit about it. So Northern California, Southern Cascades uh, has a very tall mountain, Mount Shasta. The rest of the landscape, not so tall. 95% of the Sacramento Basin is below 7,500 feet. So when we have a really warm atmospheric river with a freezing elevation of 10,000 feet, the whole watershed's getting rain, and we see what a whole watershed contributing can do. It's pretty exciting. Just to the south in the San Joaquin Basin, though, half the watershed's above 7,500 feet. It's a snowmelt-dominated basin. In other words, the biggest flows out of the basin normally happen with the snowmelt. Now, we had a really interesting event happen in early April in 2018. Super Typhoon Jellawat, which having a super typhoon in the Western Pacific in March is kind of an exciting thing. Usually it takes a summer to build up enough heat to develop that much energy to have a storm, but we had one. It got caught into a rather strong jet that extended across the Pacific and it came across. Thankfully it had to ride over a ridge because that changed the orientation of the storm with respect to the topography. And that's a really important piece of the puzzle we'll get to in a little more detail later. But that said, 13,000 foot freezing elevation in the Merced River watershed. Albeit a fast hitting storm, it still produced a top 10 flood. So there's your glimpse into higher snow lines in a snowmelt dominated basin that has yet to see rain to the top of the watershed. Could be an interesting adventure. Now, atmospheric river activity, the big three. Well, one of the reasons the big three are the big three is because our atmospheric river activity peaks late December, mid-January. And if we think of our historic floods, a lot of them happen between Christmas and into the early part of January. Now, we have a few late stragglers, the February 86 event, um, February 2019 had some interesting events, and we'll talk about those in a little bit as well. And one last piece on topography, the Golden Gate is a really important gap in the terrain. Not only because that's where the ocean moves into the bay and in through the Carquina Strait into the delta, but it's also a terrain gap for atmospheric rivers. There's no terrain blocking heavy moisture flowing through that gap. And with a southwesterly flow, flow out of the southwest to the northeast, it does a beautiful job of lighting up the American Yuba and Feather River watersheds, which is how the Feather River watershed can be massively productive. So it's really important to understand there's the atmosphere, there's the oceans, and there's the land surface, all working together to create what we have here in California. Now let's talk about normals. Good old NOAA climate normals, 30 years. This is our average conditions. It's what we're supposed to look like. So in this case, I'm using a same simple averaging technique. The challenge with the NOAA is each time they do a normal, they try out a new statistical technique. So you can't compare one normal to the other because it's a different methodology. A little bit of a challenge, but in this case, this is just a simple average of statewide average temperature and statewide precip. We have the first, 1901 to 1930, 20th century getting started. And we see the blues and the blue triangle. There's that normal precip's about 24 inches, temperature a little warmer than 56 degrees Fahrenheit. We see the circles largely clustered around that triangle. A few extremes, evenly on warm and cold. Now let's move to the diamonds. This is our latest normal. Well, the diamond is the normal, pre-supplies. 
almost 24 inches. Temperature-wise, though, we're past 58 degrees Fahrenheit already. So the world's warming. It's, this is observed data. We're, we're warmer than we were at the start of the 20th century. Uh, but look at the variability year to year. The, the squares have started wandering and really seeing uh, things really move out, uh, both in the wet cold, the two squares that are back with the blue distribution, but then all the ones that are carving out new territory, including 2015 out there near 61 degrees for an average annual temperature for the state. Also the year without a snowpack, only 5% average on April 1. Well, let's talk about that year-to-year -year variability and how we look at it scale-wise. So here we're going to use a product from West Ranger Climate Center, the California Climate Tracker, and here we're going to use our climate divisions. Uh, climate divisions back east tend to be small, almost county level. Out here, uh, decided to be a little more economical. Uh, we have seven of them. Uh, nicely, Climate Division 2 is the Sacramento Basin. Uh, climate Division 5 tends to be the San Joaquin and Tulare Lake Bed region. Uh, but we look in 2022, the last year of the latest multi-year drought, one of the warmer on record, and we really see a lot of bright oranges there, almost not far edge of the distribution, but really in the warmest, 10%. Now, this past year, monster year, one of the coldest in over a decade. And we're right in the middle of the historical distribution. So our coldest years now are only about average. That's kind of an interesting tale, but we see it's not always even, right? The South Coast, North Lahontan regions had a little cooler, um, but now we're going to look at it even differently at a different scale. Now we're going to go back to statewide, but we're going to go to a daily time step. And this comes to us from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And the dashed lines are the climatological mean temperature, uh, maximum in orange, minimum in green, working our way through the year. And so we can see the minimum annual temperature of December, January, maximizing there late July, early August. But what we see in 2022 is there were cold extremes, one in May. So wait, one of the warmest years is, could have had a cold event that could have impacted ag production in a pretty significant way. So how we measure how warm or cold we are matters. How we aggregate our statistics matters. Then we all have the Labor Day heat wave. For those of us that have lived out here, we um, got to experience that. And, and you see, it was a really long duration, very extreme event. The little dots on there mean is set new records. And that was statewide. Um, you know, here in Sacramento, we hit 113. Uh, and Heldsburg in the Russian River, just to the west of us, hit 115. Uh, temperatures we normally like to leave to the southeast deserts. Uh, so really interesting. So now let's look at the big year, right? Because this was really interesting and really important. Very thankfully, that spring shows a lot of blues there. Why is that? Because we had one monster snowpack. One of the four largest in our historical record. And uh, very nicely, when we have a cool spring, that helps facilitate a melt that becomes manageable. But for that cold year, we still had a pretty hot, not as many, not as long, but some episodic elements in July where it was definitely not a cool year. And so how we articulate the when of the warmer cold and how that wraps together to form the year that forms a dot on the plot that then goes into defining the normal. So how do we roll all of that up? How do we keep track of it all? And which one of these are important for which process you're trying to track? Which one of these are important for which aspect of water management that's for that day, reacting for that time? And then how does that add up? It's not this nice, smooth climatological walk. That's the one thing we almost never see and probably really hard to land on. So if we think about it and we think about our modeling and we think about we use average as our descriptor and you have a larger variance, should you be surprised that the predictor's not working as well if you're trying to predict average when it's the one thing you're not getting? Just something to chew on there. 
Um, now let's talk about atmospheric rivers, because maybe not everybody's familiar with these fantastic beasts. Uh, discovered in 1998 with microwave satellite imagery. Got a little bit of a wake-up call. What? Moisture in the atmosphere isn't evenly distributed from the tropics to the poles? No, it turns out 90% of the transport happens in 10% of the area. A lot of dry space and a whole lot of excitement in others. Now, when we wrap these up and you find that most of it's in that first two and a half kilometers of the atmosphere. There's the Golden Gate importance there. These get wrapped up into the leading edge, so the warm front part of a storm, which we will find out later this afternoon, hopefully get you done here, out of here before three when things really get wet, but if not, hopefully you have umbrellas. Um, although the winds might make the umbrella a little less useful, but anyway, these get wrapped up and on the warm edge. Now it's, it's understanding the temperature dynamics of that moisture transport relative to the temperature and dynamics of the storm. Because it's two pieces working together, interacting with the land surface that delivers our precipitation, tells us where we're rain, where we're snow, and how it moves across the landscape. Because these, as you see in the little animation there, they're not constant, they're very dynamic. And we can actually watch things happen over hours. So wait, we talked about daily data, now we're into hourly data. Or we can watch the freezing elevation go from 10,000 feet to 2,000 feet as that cold front moves through. Really exciting if you happen to be driving uh, over a pass during that event. Uh, the other element is as you're driving over that pass, particularly on I-80, as you're going up and you're going up the uphill part of it, you notice it is really raining hard. And that's the orographic effect. You get into the saddle and you get a little break before the next white knuckle ride on the next rise. So where the terrain's lifting is really important, but here's the kicker with atmospheric rivers then. It's important the angle that it impacts the landscape because our landscape isn't just uniformly uphill. The reason the Feather River lights up so beautifully with a southwesterly flow is the massive of Bucks Lake in the front of the watershed. Is a huge steep lift right at the front of the watershed. So it's a completely not the way we learned how to draw a watershed in hydrology class, right? Where everything just slopes up nicely to the back. No, in this basin, it's a lot up front there. We have a ridge in the middle and then there's a whole bunch in the back, all because of the geology of three mountain ranges coming together. The third one are the Diamond Mountains that are in Nevada that come in. So there's actually a place in the Feather Basin, if you ever get there, it's really kind of cool where you can look to the south, you see the granite formation of the Sierra. You look to the north, you see the volcanic formations of the Cascades, and you look to the east and you see the Diamond Mountains. One of the few places on earth where that happens. But a really cool part of a really important watershed in the state. Now, so why do we care so much about atmospheric rivers? Well, it turns out the big ones make a difference. Last three years of the drought, 2021 and 22, <coughs> not a whole lot of big atmospheric rivers happen. Now we have to describe this a little bit, how we size an atmospheric river. We decided to size it by the amount of water vapor being transported. So we call it integrated vapor transport. Now in this case, we're integrating over the vertical because the satellites are really good at seeing the total depth, right? Now there's again, the devil in the details. It's really important where in the depth that moisture is. And the reason for that is we see how much gets taken out by the coastal range, how much has a free run at the Sierra. But then if it's even deeper than the Northern Sierra, our good friends over in Reno can see what they call a spillover effect where the atmospheric river has given free rain to fall on them. And then things get exciting over there. Now we see in 2021 and 22, and notice um, and we go from week, week is 250 uh, flux units. And I think if you look in there, you can read the kilograms, meters per square element. 250 to 500 week. That's our baseline atmospheric curve. You have to have that much moisture transport to really get this effect to kick in. There we go to moderate, 500 to 750, strong, 750 to 1,000. Um, believe extreme and then exceptional. Now the exceptional, we see one even in the midst of a record-setting multi-year drought 
We had an exceptional atmospheric river. Guess what? We had one in the previous multi-year drought too in 2015. So we may not get a lot of them, but they're still there, but it's not enough of them. Now look at between 2021 and 22, that's three years worth, and then one year worth. But look where they're located, look how they're angled. And if you read the dates on them, look how close they are together. So we refer to this as the timing, pace, and scale of these events that really matter that lead to a different precip outcome. And, and the coloring on the graphics there are the precip. Uh, fairly dry year, 2021, 20, 22, but 23, a really wet year. But I want you to look closely at that, and we'll get into this a little closer. The wettest part of our state is the northernmost part of our state most of the time. Last year, it was not. So now you might have heard that today we're getting a Category 3 atmospheric river. Uh, really exciting. The media has picked this up. So there's another element to it, not just the strength, but the duration. So we came up with a way to parse between strength and duration and figure out the ones that are kind of the foundation of our water supply. The ones and twos. Those are the ones we like because they come in, they drop a lot of moisture, but it's manageable. And if we get the right freezing elevations, we can build a nice snowpack with them. Now we get into the threes, and this is where things get kind of interesting because you can get enough water that we start to see high water. So the rivers get high enough, we start to see flood impacts manifest themselves. Now we get to the fours and fives. We can be pretty certain we're going to see some at least localized flooding. Now understanding the antecedent conditions, when you have an exceptional atmospheric river come in, after extraordinary dryness, as the October 21 event came in, remember, water year 2021 was the second dry single year in over 100 years. Only missed 1924 by a few tenths of an inch. So, I mean, we are down at the worst of the worst kind of years. Then in October, we get this massive storm. Record-setting low pressure off of Aberdeen, Washington. Absolutely a monstrous flow through that Golden Gate. We still got the Sacramento River to come up 15 feet out of that one event. It's just when you're coming up off dry, you don't quite get flood. But if it's coming in when the water river's already high, then things get exciting. So understanding time and pace and scale of the storms is really important. So this is how we're trying to do it, how to communicate. And to see, as you can see on these graphics, the variability spatially. It's not the same event everywhere, depending on how that moisture transport is hitting the west coast of North America, and for how long those conditions are present leads to how much we get. But not all moisture gets converted to rain. Honestly, it's only 25, 30%. Uh, so really trying to figure out all those things that come together. Now, you might ask yourself, you say, well, given all that, how do you make a climatology? Launched just last week from our friends at Scripps, and this is pretty cool. It's We call it the Atmospheric River Catalog. Not really a full climatology yet, but we went through the reanalysis period and analyzed every atmospheric river event in the reanalysis and categorized it. Where did it rank? Either not on the scale, one, two, three, four, and five. And we look at it by year, so you see the year-to-year -year variability in that Use my pointer here, so I can be this one. We look at October, November, December, January, February through July, and so we see the big three tend to be when we get the most. Now this is fun because in other parts of the country, this isn't the pattern, right? Back east, this would be kind of terrifying that you have the wet and then the dry. You you kind of have a more evenly defined seasonal behavior. Would that, for those of you on the East Coast, hopefully that's a fair characterization. But here we definitely have seasonality. We know when things get exciting. But not only that, we can look at all these events on kind of a windrows, how they come in. Well, we also notice because of the moisture, the way the dynamics work in this part of the planet, there's a certain angle these storms come in. They can come in out of the north. 
We get the cold air dropping in, and they can drop in. We get these ones, again, kind of coming up and backing in. We can get it out of the southeast. That's a little unusual, but the, today's is going to be down here southerly because this thing is pushing against the coast, but it's kind of flattening, so we're getting a lot of southerly. So the winds this evening that you'll notice are out of the south. But then we look at when we do it by scale. Where are the big bad beasts? Well, they're those southwesterly flows because we have the clearest connection down into the tropics where the deep moisture is. And we can really tap into it effectively. Well, this is all good knowledge because we can now learn how to leverage this in recognizing the signs of when the atmosphere is setting up more broadly to be more favorable to an event that provides more water that helps us with that timing, pace, and scale of events. More work to be done. Like I said, this was just launched a few weeks ago, uh, hoping for more. Now, get to the more interesting stuff, right? The rain, snow. Well, we came up with an indicator, all right? Something we can track through time to track change, year to year. Well, how much of the precip was falling as rain, how much as snow? And here we go year to year, and we have a departure plot. On average, about 74% falls is rain because most of California is pretty low elevation. A few times we get cold years and we get snow down to 2,000 feet, occasionally down to Auburn at 1,000 feet, they get a little ephemeral snow. Um, last year we had a few storms that really got exciting for folks who probably lived where they live because they don't like snow, but they got to experience it uh, to the extent they had to be dug out because they had no snow removal equipment of their own. Um, but the rain snow boundary is extremely complex. Every watershed is its own beast because it has its own topography and it has its own orientation and it interacts with the atmosphere in its own way. And so we figure out, well, with the indicator we see year to year, we can maybe see more rain, less snow. Uh, we begin to see seasonally. Well, our springs and our falls are getting less friendly to snow. Um, but every watershed's different. So saying California has, you have to be a little careful with. Really have to understand for the watershed what it's facing, what it's experiencing, and where it is. Because we span 10 degrees of latitude. Entertainingly enough, we span 10 degrees of longitude, too. For, uh, really want to think about it. Um, you're flying east when you fly from Reno to LA. It's south, southeast, but you are going east because LA is east of Reno, if you look at the longitude of the two communities. So our April 1 snowpack, this is the fantastic metric. We all wait in water management, right? This is the magic number. Historically, average peak of the snowpack. Set a lot of rules by this one. But look at that year-to-year -year variability. Holy cow. Another thing to look at is the really, really big years, right? 23 joining 83, 69, 52. And we only go back to 1952 because that's when we had enough measurements to organize and we felt we had a decent sample and we get there. Now, if we look at the automated measurements with our snow pillows, where we have more of those scattered across the landscape, 83 is the first one. So in this case, we only catch two of them. Uh, but you see there uh, in that drought, 12 to 16, um, a four-year run there. If you average those four years, that's an average of a 33% of average snowpack. Keep that number in mind by the time we get to the end of the talk. We're getting there. All right, so this is last year versus average, as you see it. It was a fantastic year, but look at the melt face. It's pretty steep. We still end up getting, by the time we get to July, we have a high enough sun angle, we have long enough days, we have enough energy, we will melt that pack. Uh, you see the beginning of this year, the dark bold line there off to kind of a slow start, picking up over the last month, and uh, certainly after this weekend, we'll jump a little further. The little graphic over there shows you where our snow-bearing watersheds are in the state. 
so it's not everywhere. Um, but with a warmer world, the snow patterns are changing, right? We have elevations that change. But think about that temperature change over the elevation and think about with a storm, that temperature change. You can warm and go from 22 degrees where it's not productive for snow to 28 degrees and it becomes really productive for snow. So at the higher elevations, we can suddenly get a bigger pack, smaller amount of watershed, but a bigger pack. So if we're, all that's going on and I'm just measuring at a few index points and I'm relying on that relationship, those index points, might not be telling the same story each time. And we got caught by that recently. So we decided, hey, let's work. And we had been, I say, we just do this, right? No, this took 10 years to figure out how to do this which is fly an airplane over the mountains, measuring snow with LIDAR and mass spectrometry. And it's really cool because it tells us where the snow is, how it's distributed, but it also with some modeling helps us understand how ready to melt it is. So it's not the fear of, oh my God, the great warm up, it's all gonna melt. No because a good chunk of it isn't ready to, it doesn't have enough energy in it to make that phase transition. This helps us describe that. It also tells us where the snow is and isn't and how that's changing. So this is gonna be a great way to track it, as long as we can keep doing it. Uh, this is taking a research idea and trying to pivot it into an ongoing operational activity. That's not an easy transition to make, right? the great divide between research and operations. We're working on it, really good products, and we'll see how we get there. So anyway, now we get to runoff, right? The water, they actually get to manage. Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers, they're a little different. Sacramento River on average has 18 million acre feet of water come out of it each year. Average runoff at least ferry on the Colorado River is what? 12 million? Well, at least they parsed 12 million. Um, so we're wetter than the upper Colorado basin. Now we just flip across the Delta, right? Not too far away. Have a turn off. Not quite six. A third. Wow. That's kind of fascinating. So you have this really interesting space that's having very different volumes of water come at it from different directions at different times. And you see the year-to-year -year variability and you see the impact of those extended droughts where it collapses for a while. Now let's look at it from the snowmelt perspective. About a third of the annual runoff out of the Sacramento Basin is snowmelt. Two thirds of the San Joaquin. A higher elevation, snowmelt dominated basin tends to peak its runoff during the snowmelt season where a peak runoff in the Sacramento Basin tends to be in that winter runoff. A lot of that also, we have elevation, we have location, north-south in terms of latitude of where the storm track peaks. Atmospheric river activity peaks latitude-wise normally between the Bay Area and Point Arena. So north of the San Joaquin Basin, we need the deviations south or the storm to sag south to get into it. Now we get one of those variabilities later this weekend. If you happen to be staying around that long, Sunday into Monday, it'll be a really exciting storm, really impacting the center part of the state again. Um, so we'll see some impacts from that event. Um, anyway, so now we have one last thing and I do need to pick this up a bit. Sea level rise, this is great. This is open coast though. And as you see, one of those lines isn't going up, but that's up at Crescent City. That's in a different geological part, right? We get to the Mendocino Fracture Zone around Cape Mendocino. That's actually where we shift from tectonic plates sliding by each other into the Cascadia Subduction Zone where one plate's diving under the other and lifting up the landform until it collapses. And you see these in the sediment records where we have these great subduction quakes. Boom, instant sea level rise versus progressive sea level rise. So a really interesting dynamic on our open coast, but that says nothing about what happens in the bay and the delta, because I have two straits that govern how much flow can get in over the tidal cycle. And so sea level rise means you have an incremental addition of flow in through the gate. 
so a lot of complexity there, a lot of fun and a lot to try and keep track of. But notice we only track it on the open coast. Uh, from extreme to common, this is an idea I want to kind of get into your head. Now, we went from episodic to rare in terms of big snowpacks. But in terms of temperatures, 1934 was a really weird year. S -s Stupid warm. Stood out. This is the statewide minimum temperatures. Decades. Hadn't seen it before. Hadn't seen it for decades since till we get to the 80s. So, wow, rare event, right? See it once in my lifetime. I'm great. I'm done. So you get to the 90s and it starts happening episodically. You're like, hmm, this could be an interesting situation. Well, in the last decade, every single year is as big or greater than that once freakishly extreme year. I really hope we're ready to deal with a world that looks like this because it's there. And this is how climate change happens. We start with something we see as an extreme. 2015, the year without a snowpack, is still an extreme. Those four years averaging 33% of what we'd normally get. That was an extreme. But our expectations are it will become episodic, it will become commonplace. The climate change narrative is about what is commonplace in the future. Getting there is going to be an interesting ride. A little more on our decade of extremes and want to talk a little bit about... Yep, I'll be wrapping up real quick. Um, talk about extremes. And this is a different way of looking at it from kind of expected. Our water management works really good when the water years land here. In the anomalous category, we have to make some changes. We have to use some of our tools to deal when things aren't right. And then when we're in an extreme condition, really have to have emergency measures kicked in. Well, if people are kind of wondering why we're having to utilize those emergency measures and go into the tool belt when things aren't in the expected category, it's because they haven't found their way there in the past decade. We only had one year where it all worked out great. The monster year, monster El Nino year of 2016. Uh, we finally got an average snowpack and average precinct. Um, Otherwise, we're really in that warmer, drier, low snowpack world, often in the extremes. Uh, that's led to some really exciting fire behavior that's changed entirely. Uh, largest fires there, this is the top 10. If you look at the dates on those, most of them are 2020 or 2015 and afterward. Our biggest fires are what we're experiencing. And some of these are pretty frightful. Uh, Feather River Watershed, for those of you wondering, hey, why is the watershed different? Well. In the past five years, burned a good chunk of the watershed. It is a different watershed than it was from the drought of 2012 to 2015. It's a different place now. Understanding how this works, how this changes the watershed dynamics is really going to be important. Because the other thing, again, an extreme condition becoming episodic and then in this case, really hoping normal doesn't happen because it's going to be pretty hard. So there's that. One last word on warmer, why are warmer droughts worse? Well, again, winter, we don't go to sleep anymore. Plants, if it's warm, they will transpire. And at elevation bands where it's not getting cold enough for those plants to go to sleep, they don't go to sleep. They continue to transpire. So they continue to dry the landscape. So on the dry days, if it's not wetting with rain, it's drying from warm. And how, again, manifests itself across the landscape, where the elevation bands are important, really defines how drought manifests itself in California. Within year variability, there's just beginning of December 2022, fourth year of a drought really starting to kick in. All of a sudden, wow, entertaining left starting on my birthday. Um, winter in three weeks. Instead of 90 days, 18 days, 86% of a snowpack formed and... 46% of the annual precip showed up, and you see Central California was the widest. That's a pattern very similar to 1969, by the way. Uh, March events brought the Tulare Lake back, last seen in 83, uh, then fed by snowmelt. So finishing up here, really just want to talk about then a more dynamic water management framework. Working with our research partners, better understanding the state of the watershed and observations. Lead time with forecasts to have a better sense of what we can do with the water, when to move it, where, and that decision support to take really awesome observations, really cool forecasts, but until you get them to where they're informing a decision, they're just gee whiz science. If we do all that, we increase our managed water capability, we're mitigating our hazard, we're hopefully getting more out of our benefit, but to do this, 
you need communication, collaboration, and coordination. A whole lot to do. This is what it looked like last year where we actually tried to get some of that abundant surface water back into the ground through some managed aquifer recharge. We have some really cool monitoring assets, some really cool forecasting assets in place now, trying to put them all together. Tracking change, have an annual report, sent you the link, hopefully you enjoyed them. The indicators report done by Cal EPA, fourth one just came out. That's how they divide it now, tribes perspectives being included for the first time. And our assessments that we talked about, we're on number five right now uh, that we're beginning. If you want data, CalAdapt, really cool work going on here to make the data more discoverable, accessible with some really cool tools. And this is the projection information. So climate change projection information lives here. For those end of century expectations, uh, mean temperature, another five to eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer. So that gonna keep moving down the chart, but no strong single in precip. We're gonna be all over the place, but the average is probably gonna hang out about the same. But we're gonna lose about two thirds of the seasonal snowpack. Well, we've already seen that. You got your extreme, it's gonna become common. You had to practice round, <coughs> you'll have more coming soon. Those will lead to runoff timing changes and that will depend on geology, particularly in the Southern Cascades that rely on a charging of the aquifers <coughs> to generate runoff and about 20 inches of sea level rise on the open coast. Warming world, new extremes, more of them. How will you understand how all this fits together, the ability to manage those extremes, <coughs> doing now flood and drought together, maintaining supply reliability, mitigating flood risk. To do that, more spatially explicit data, more frequent time intervals. Really important to understand, but that takes a lot of effort. And then working on that forecast improvement, longer lead time, <coughs> greater clarity in your available flexibility. Flexibility is what's needed in water management to make this work. Trying to meet multiple management criteria. With that, uh, there's my email address if you ever want to ask me questions. There's the storm from 2021 in October. A really brilliant thing. All righty. Thanks for your time. Sorry to run over. Are you going to be with us after lunch? Uh, no, I got to go deal with the storm. <laughs> one, of my, one of my side gigs is I work emergency response. So, Okay. <clears throat> so I think what we'll do is hold questions. Um, but put them in the shared document and perhaps we could get them out to you. Yes, if you send them to me. And happy to go through them, answer them, and get information back to you. Okay, great, because we've got a few folks stacked up uh, for, for this next one. Right. But you. let's thank uh, Dr. Anderson once more. And we're particularly appreciative, of course, of the, the data sources that you included in the presentation. So now we're going to go to the open mic uh, session. Uh, and I'd like to thank the presenters we've had over the last two days who've agreed to hang around until the end of the open mic session because there were many committee questions which we didn't get to. So they've agreed to st stick around for another half hour or so. So we'll try and get to many of those questions as possible. Uh, so we're now moving to the open mic session. And we'd like to ask, uh, as you're speaking, I'll call your name. If you'd like to come up uh, to the podium so you can see, see the committee. And uh, as I say, it's about five minutes each. And the first. <clears throat> yeah, the, the first speaker is Ashley Overhouse uh, with the Defenders of Wildlife. Thanks for being here, Ashley. This is fun being able to watch myself here on the computer. 
Okay, well, good morning. What's left of it, committee members? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Ashley Overhouse, I'm the Water Policy Advisor with Defenders of Wildlife, their California program. Defenders of Wildlife is a national conservation organization founded in 1947 and dedicated to protecting all wild animals and plants in their natural communities. To this end, we employ science, public education, and participation, legislative advocacy, litigation, and proactive on the ground solutions. Um, to impede the accelerating rate of extinction of species, associated loss of biological diversity, and habitat alteration and destruction. Defenders has over 2.1 million members and supporters nationwide, with more than 316,000 in California. As Water Policy Advisor, I work on a variety of issues statewide, including the enforcement of environmental laws to protect wildlife that rely on a healthy Bay Delta estuary and Central Valley wetlands. I have a background in water law and policy, and I hold a JD from UC Law, San Francisco, and an LLM in international water law from the University of London. I have worked on water policy in California for six years. So like the panel yesterday, my public comment will be structured to answer the three questions that were posed um, by the National Academy staff. So first, what is the role of defenders in the CVP and Delta more generally? As you all have gathered from yesterday and today's great presentations, the San Francisco Bay Delta is a unique biodiverse ecosystem. Several species of native fish that live in or migrate through the estuary are listed as threatened or endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act or the California Endangered Species Act. Federally listed species and state listed species have been enumerated for you many times today, so I will not repeat those. Um, and operation of federal Central Valley project and state water project operations result in take of all of these species. And Reclamation and the Department of Water Resources need incidental take coverage under the Endangered Species Act and State Endangered Species Act to operate the projects. The rules for operation, how much water can be pumped for the Delta at certain times, for example, or temperatures below Shasta Dam, et cetera, are enormously consequential for imperiled Bay Delta species. That is why Defenders has been very involved in efforts to ensure that Endangered Species Act and State Endangered Species Act protections are adequate to safeguard listed Bay Delta species. The protections Defenders has sought to benefit listed species improve conditions for a myriad of other native species in the estuary, including fall run Chinook salmon, which are important for the salmon fishing industry. One such forum where I spend a great deal of time is with the Bureau of Reclamation on the development of the long-term coordinated operations as part of the reinitiation of consultation process for the new biological opinions on the projects as an interested party. So that's why I'm up here before you today. Overall, I believe the Bureau has done a great job of informing interested parties in this technically complex process, and I'm personally grateful. I look forward to continuing to engage the other agencies in this important process over this coming year. That being said, there are a number of other issues that I would like to raise for this committee now in order to give members time to solicit additional information over the course of this process. So the second question, what would your organization like the committee to accomplish in terms of injecting the best science into CVP or state water project operations? First and foremost, despite some of the messages you heard yesterday, I would urge the committee to please adhere to the statement of task outlined before you which is still robust um, and may be very informative for all the agencies involved to ensure they are meeting their legal obligations. In other words, we would really first and foremost like to see you accomplish the statement of task. As Mr. Grimaldo referenced yesterday, the National Academy's previous study in 2012 did not stick to the statement of task and consequently published three different reports over the course of many years. The silver lining, in my opinion, is that through that process, much of the necessary background is uh, been done for you. In fact, there is even overlap with these committee members and those that reviewed those draft reports before publication. In other words, your problem statement, the underlying issues, gaps in information and needs for integrating science into effective water management have been examined by this entity uh, already in published literature. While it is disappointing to admit most of that 12-year-old paper and reports are still very much relevant to this committee. And for example, the underlying issue of that the Bay Delta plan has still not been updated. That all being said, as a reminder, Professor Burke outlined in great detail yesterday the legal landscape for you. That is really the goal here, to ensure that coordinated operations of these projects fulfill their legal obligations. It is critically important to do 
regardless of other competing interests or even taking into account other important factors like social science, important communications, um, and improved communications between agencies, for example. Those are outside the scope, in my opinion, of this study and this committee. In order for you to be successful and actually produce a report that would be helpful, I urge you to stick to the statement of task and be aware of legal requirements the agencies are tasked with addressing. Just one, that was mentioned yesterday in great detail, and again this morning briefly, are the Endangered Species Act compliance. I don't think it can be overstated that ESA protections are critical when agencies are discussing the functional extinction of at least one of those species and today hearing that the other will possibly be moved to endangered status. Examining the state of science for even just two species within the operational context will be useful and defining numeric achievable biological objectives for species recovery. Second, defenders would also urge the committee to critically review the voluntary agreement as it pertains to your statement of task. A 2022 memorandum of understanding between a group of water districts, state agencies and the Bureau of Reclamation proposes a Bay Delta voluntary agreement a process that Defenders was once engaged in. It is the latest attempt to undermine the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan update process by the State Water Board, as you heard from yesterday. The VA is intended, in our opinion, to replace existing standards and circumvent increased State Board protections for the Bay Delta and Central Valley Rivers. In short, the VA proposal is incomplete, unenforceable, inequitable, inadequate, and lacks a scientific foundation. And unfortunately, it is integrated into this reconsultation process. This is just one of the many concerns we have as an interested party, and I'm more than happy to provide this committee um, the, with more materials on this issue and many others, such as the continuing reliance on temporary urgency change petitions, um, adhering to the Central Valley Project Improvement Act's mandate for refuge water supply, how flow is the master variable, et cetera. I know there is quite a bit to review, and there are still more meetings to come. Finally, due to time constraints, I want to let others speak. Um, for the second cycle of this study, defenders would recommend this committee consider including the state of science for other listed species impacted by project operations, including the pending listings for longfin smelt, like you heard about this morning, under the ESA and white sturgeon, that is pending listings under the Federal Endangered Species Act and the State Endangered Species Act. Finally, the third question, how can your organization contribute to the work of the committee? While I am here and offer and promise to be here at future meetings and engage where it is appropriate. Um, and I wanted to thank you for your time today, engagement in this process, consideration of our viewpoints and Defenders very much looks forward to the results. Thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Ashley. And of course, uh, any of those notes, all or part, if you'd like to submit those so the committee can reflect in them more than just a presentation, please uh, forward them to the staff. Absolutely, will do. Thank you. Uh, uh, no, we don't have time for that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. The, the, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. uh, the, the second speaker is Cindy Meyer, who's with the state uh, or the water contractors. Sorry, Cindy. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'll just take a second to introduce myself. My name is Cindy Meyer. Um, I've had some interesting experiences. I've worked for NIMS. I've worked for Reclamation. I now work for the Water Authority. I've been on the water doing research. Um, I survived doing a marine biology degree for my undergrad and then continued to survive through the process of getting a master's and a PhD. Um, and I was very excited by the presentation this morning because my PhD dissertation work was actually in vulnerability assessment, climate change in the near shore habitat. So that was nice to see some of that science again. Um, I wanna thank you so much for being here and being part of this process. It has been about three years that we've been Looking forward to this moment um, to get everybody together in the NAS review. It's been a lot of dedication and work from the staff at Reclamation, um, from NAS, and also the Delta Science Program to make sure we could get you all here. And really appreciate your time and effort that's going to be uh, contributed throughout this process. So um, I just want to start with one quick note. As we were talking about the atmospheric rivers in the last presentation, just for those of you who aren't from here, because this was new and different to me, 
is they're also referred to as the Pineapple Express if they're calling, coming from that Southwest side. So if you hear Pineapple Express, that is actually an atmospheric river. Um, <laughs> so uh, as you've deduced, the LTO is a bit complicated. Um, however, we're hopeful to continue improving the LTO to create a sustainable and resilient water supply for the communities and the environment. Uh, as I mentioned, I am with the San Luis Delta and Mendota Water Authority. I transitioned over there after abandoning Mario, and I am the special programs manager and very excited to be also the, the science coordinator. Uh, so the San Luis Delta Mendota Water Authority was established in 1992. It consists of 27 member agencies uh, providing water service to approximately 1.2 million acres of irrigated agriculture, about 2 million people, and 130 acres of wetlands. So we have a pretty big area to service. One of the primary purposes um, of the authority was to also assume the operation and maintenance responsibilities for certain uh, CVP facilities uh, for USBR, um, including the Jones pumping plant that you'll be visiting on the field trip tomorrow. So we hope you enjoy that. Uh, in addition, as you take the drive down to that area, um, you'll also see the Delta Mendota Canal, uh, which delivers 3 million acre feet of water within the authority service area. So broken down, that's about 2.5 million acre feet delivered to agricultural lands, uh, about 150 to 200,000 acre feet for M&I, and about 250 to 300,000 acre feet for wildlife refuges and habitat. The Water Authority, we also serve our 27 member agencies by providing information, representation needs to our members, including facilitating water transfers. While some of the member agencies have riparian and appropriative water rights, additional water is needed to support the communities, especially during drought community or drought conditions. And we also have um, a lot of disadvantaged communities uh, that we try to help out as well. So in addition, the Water Authority is dedicated to working with the agencies, the water contractors, and interested parties through coordination groups. As Reclamation mentioned yesterday, there are a lot of coordination groups. Um, some of these uh, include science forums, real-time monitoring, adaptive management, and, and many, many more. Um, the Water Authority also recently established a science program to support the science needs of our community and continue building capacity in anticipation of the future needs in our area. Uh, the Water Authority looks forward to providing support uh, to this NAS review by providing information, um, of course, tours and our expertise. As our hopes of, of what to accomplish through this NAS review, um, really the scope, the scope was really well thought out and we appreciate your input on that, um, as well as looking and considering the current usage of the science and modeling and how it's being applied to management, and if there's potential to improve, where, where are we missing opportunities to improve and make this better and more confident? Um, as the former project leader for the LTO, the 2020 version, um, I great, greatly empathize with you and the challenge to understand this incredibly complicated CVP and SWP, uh, SWP system. Um, just as a side note, the 2020 um, final document uh, for the LTO was uh, about 14,000 pages of appendices that sat printed out in my office. So um, chances are you're going to have a heavy lift in front of you to understand this. Um, but we're all here to support you and to help out and to answer questions. So thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity and um, sending you all the best for a successful review. Right, thank you, Cindy. And also for keeping to time, uh, the next speaker is Regina Chichizola, who is with the Save California Salmon. Is Regina with us? Oh, okay, so we'll, we'll shift her to the virtual. Um, the next speaker is Scott Hamilton with the Center for California Water Resources Policy and Management. Hey, Scott, good to see you. You too, Peter, good to see you again. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Scott Hamilton. I am a senior scientist with the Center for California Water Resources Policy and Management. The operators of the state and federal water projects are in a very difficult position. While I have articulated a charge to you, I suspect there is much behind their request. They are mandated to meet a number of important and often conflicting objectives, including water supply and environmental enhancement. In trying to operate to meet one competing objective, they have two big problems. One is identifying trustworthy science. The second is sociological. You heard several times yesterday references to combat science, studies from one group with one agenda presenting one result and a different group, often using the same data, but with a different agenda presenting contradictory results. What is the Bureau to do? The quality of science employed on Delta issues varies. Errors are too frequent. Use of univariate analysis that emit more relevant covariates, compelling conceptual models, but with elements not supported by the data, confounding misuse of conventional terminology and incomplete use of the scientific process. All of these errors can lead to implementation of inappropriate measures. As noted, there is much at stake, survival of species, jobs and water supplies to support the hopes and dreams of literally tens of millions of people and one of the largest economies in the world. On both sides, people are passionate and rightly so. The Bureau is stuck in the middle. Whatever they do, some people are going to be unhappy. Passion turns into rage and you can't negotiate with rage. What we have been doing has obviously not been working. CVPI go a, CVPIA goals have not been met Numerous listed species are in serious decline and water supplies are half of what people have been promised and paid for. And so the Bureau has turned to you. The intent here is not to lay blame. What we need is to understand how we can do things better. Clear and unambiguous direction would be very helpful. In answering the specific questions to which the Bureau seeks answers, we look to you to demonstrate better ways to use available data and to get results we can trust. In doing so, perhaps you could address some of the following troubling questions. Number one, when competing scientific conclusions exist, how do we recognize the best available science? Number two, in complex ecosystems, how do we identify what factors are limiting species abundance and when are they limiting? Number three, how do we know if we have correctly identified the mechanisms influencing growth and reproduction of a species when data are lacking? For example, is longfin smelt abundance higher in wet years because there's increased outflow or because the increased precipitation led to improved flows in streams, enhancing the quality and quantity of spawning habitat? Number four, should science engage in controversial issues? We have heard some of the main problems with the current system, vulnerability to floods and earthquakes, water quality declines due to sea level rise, fish strain due to unnatural flows, and entrainment at, at, of fish at water diversions. Ironically, a peripheral canal combined with newer technology would address all of those problems, but fears of what happened to the Delta would totally prevent consideration of that or any similar solution, despite the effect inverse of numerous regulatory project protections. Should, science, uh, should scientists evaluate and present their findings on such options? Number five, has our implementation of adaptive management met your standards? And if not, what should we do better? Number six, why has it been so difficult to determine if actions that have been implemented, such as the fall outflow actions for Delta Smelt, have actually been effective and met their goals? Number seven, how does the Bureau fairly and defensibly allocate resources among competing needs? And number eight, if by some miracle they can do that, how do they get people that don't agree with, the, with their decision, including state and federal agencies with narrow mandates to respect the decision? So finally, let me end with a quote. The truth is California has been much overrated and much overdone. She has been pressed beyond her limits and capacities. Her managers have been rash, prodigal and incompetent and they have embarrassed her beyond hope of relief. 
These harsh words were penned by Hinton Helper in 1855. The point is, it seems it's time we did better. We hope you can help us. Thank you. And thank you, Scott. The next speaker is Solomon Vimal from Cornell Tech. Yeah. Ready to go, Solomon? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good to meet you all. So uh, I'm a recent PhD graduate from uh, UCLA. I finished my uh, doctoral degree in water and climate. So specifically, I studied the use of uh, remote sensing imagery over a 30, 40 year period uh, over millions of lakes in the, uh, in the Arctic. And I developed innovative data science tools. So some of the breakthrough uh, technologies that I've developed as a result of my work is related to non-stationarity, the term that we use a lot in hydrologic literature. But really, uh, the work in non-stationarity in the econometrics world is far advanced by seven or eight decades. And still today in hydrology, we use like you know very simple descriptive statistics and we really don't know how to incorporate non-stationarity. So some of that IP, the technology that I developed is protected by patents. And now my technology is incubated through Cornell University's incubator for a two-year deep tech program. So my question to the committee is, uh, as with this life cycle of the salmon, right, there are, you know, baby salmons and big ones. How do big baby ideas like in a startup contribute to this committee's work? And how, how can innovative technologies also be taken to the eventual long-term plans? So that's my question to the committee. And I would like maybe a little bit of uh, discussion and I would use like maybe two, three minutes of my time for that. Yeah, I, I, actually the rules we set for this was not to engage directly, right. but I think the point you've raised <clears throat> is absolutely center to the second question we've been posed. You know, what technologies, you know, as you say, it's uh, the emergence of AI and many other tools it will certainly be part, part of what we're considering. So but thank you for raising the issue. And I saw several of the committee members nodding. But right. uh, we have to treat everyone equally. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Vimal. Uh, oh, Solomon. <clears throat> the next speaker is Keiko Mertz, who's with the Friends of the River. I know she's here. Yes. Welcome. Is this good? Okay, great. Good, I think almost afternoon now. Um, my name is Keiko Mertz and I'm the policy director of Friends of the River. I wanted to um, start by expressing my gratitude to all the members of this committee for taking on this colossal task um, and to all of the agency scientists that we've heard from yesterday and today who are deeply committed to solving this very complex um, problem. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about Friends of the River um, I might also refer to us as FOR. We work to protect and restore California rivers through hydropower reform, restoring flows, advocating for sustainable water storage solutions, flood management, and legal protection. We have a long history of work on rivers impacted by long-term operations of the CVP and SWP. For example, FOR was actually the first to highlight dam safety issues at Oroville in 2005. FOR was also instrumental in achieving wild and scenic protections for the McLeod River above Shasta Dam and led efforts to prevent the illegal Shasta Dam raise, which would have violated the California Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. On the American River, FOR worked to designate the Lower American as wild and scenic and continues to work to improve public values on the American River as a senior member of the Collaborative Water Forum. The CVP and SWP directly impact our body of work, our values, and those of there are thousands of members across the state. As we saw yesterday, there is a serious potential for, for scope creep on this review. Um, so with that in mind, we tried to tailor our list of asks to be as in scope as we could. 
So as it relates to the topics of this review, um, I asked that the committee might consider including species that are candidate for listing, um, mostly because this could help reduce the need to repeat this sort of exercise in the near future. And um, alternately, the committee could consider um, candidate species in the second cycle of this study. Regarding Shasta cold water pool management, recent research by Willis et al. published in 2021 has suggested that reservoirs actually have pretty limited effectiveness in managing cold water pools. It identified Shasta as the only reservoir that could produce a cool regime at its outlet, but even with Shasta, the, her, um, Ann Willis's research noticed, noted some issues, including that cold water regimes transition to warm water re regimes um, as a function of distance from the dam. Considering this and potentially other more recent research that I'm not aware of, um, we would like to know how this change, how, how this might change with climate change and would like to see recommendations from this committee on how that might change objections and act, um, actions for preserving cold water species. The Willis paper also notes that fish passage or dam removal are probably best to conserve cold water species. Um, so we asked this committee to evaluate opportunities for fish passage at, at Shasta Dam. I know this is a big ask and possibly a little bit out, out of scope, um, but achieving species recovery will really require thinking outside the box. And the brain trust in this room has the potential to truly move the needle on this. Um, this evaluation could also help reclamation meet its legal obligations under numerous the numerous federal and state laws outlined by Professor Burke yesterday. Um, I will provide to this committee the citation for the Wills paper and other papers that I reference in the rest of my comments. Regarding summer fall delta smelt habitat and Old and Middle River flow management, we would love to see this committee delve into the species flow abundance relationships mentioned by Eric Oppenheimer also yesterday, specifically and where feasible to identify key flow thresholds of biological significance and to couple these with specific locations, timing, and the frequency needed to achieve population growth of the species in this review. We also request that this committee analyze the voluntary agreement proposal, um, which you heard a little bit about earlier and which implicates operations of the CVP and state water project, um, but only where it overlaps with the scope of this review um, to determine if it aligns with best available science. There were some requests made yesterday by some panelists that were probably definitely out of scope for this review. However, should this committee choose to dive into some of those topics, I have a couple additional requests. First, if the committee does, dives into social studies and governance, um, I think it should include in its review research published by UC Davis professor Mark Lubell. He studies governance and social ecological systems in the Delta as it relates to complex decision-making, conflict, and science. For example, his most recent paper currently under peer review is titled Governing Science, colon, Learning Adaptive Management in the California Delta. Further, yesterday this committee was asked to calculate emissions from lost hydropower production. However, although claims have been made that hydropower is carbon-free energy, Emerging research has indicated that hydropower and reservoirs emit a significant amount of methane. This is an issue the US EPA has actually recently taken up by reporting dam and reservoir emissions to the UN uh, starting in 2022 and also initiating a research program. If this committee undertakes any emissions analyses, I would ask that it also includes in it this research, this recent research and analyzes reservoir and hydropower emissions from the projects. I know that's a huge ask. It's only if they take up that first ask. Lastly, um, we ask that the recommendations from this committee avoid the monitoring trap. More data and better understanding is certainly always helpful, um, but we really hope this committee will also provide concrete and actionable recommendations to help achieve species recovery. Friends of the River would be pleased to attend future meetings, provide additional feedback and resources, and we are committed to future engagement in this process wherever it's useful for this committee. Thank you so much for your time and consideration today, and thank you again for your incredibly important work on this. Thank you, Keiko. Uh, uh, 
The next speaker, we're, uh, we're not sure, is Lisa Marie Wyndham Myers with us? I don't see her. Um, so I assume she's going to join us virtually after lunch. Oh, that's really good. Could yeah. be on the bus tomorrow. Um, can you see her tomorrow? Okay, okay. She, she is on the sign up left. So the next uh, speaker will be Sarah Piramoon with the Santa Clara Valley Water District. My statement is very short, so hopefully you all can um, get to lunch soon. Um, my name is Sarah Piramoon. I work for the Santa Clara Valley Water District um, as a senior water resource specialist. Um, and I just wanted to come in front of you to kind of represent, you know, what it, what it looks like to be an interested party. Um, Santa Clara Valley Water District is um, a unique player because it, it receives water from both the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project. Um, and those supplies make up about 50% of the water supply for the Silicon Valley. Um, so, and not only just for, for the 2 million residents, but the businesses, and we also have agricultural interests and a robust groundwater recharge program. So a lot of those imported water sources go straight back into the groundwater. So it's pretty important for us to have some sense of, um, uh, where these these consultations are are going um and uh, not trying to influence anything but but what you're doing here is really important and we really do appreciate usbr for taking the initi initiative to convene this committee and and be a part of a transparent process to um, build up the the available best available science um <clears throat> so i did uh, just want to mention um, let's see, we are doing our part to reduce reliance on Delta sor sources. I know that that is, is um, a continual theme here, and I just want to let you know that while we are doing everything we can, those changes don't happen overnight. Um, and so we still are very reliant on the water that comes through those two projects. Um, and we're, we're eager to see that this consultation is concluded in 2024. I know that that's a little bit different on the timing of your all your work with the reports not being available till next year. Um, but we do think that it's still important to build up that that body of best available science and continually improve it. Um, and I think equally important, the committee's recommendations may identify new tools that potentially could lead to a more flexible adaptive management program. And we'd like to see that kind of effort. Um, well, you know, after that climate change talk, I think that the need for flexibility into the future is gonna become more and more important. Um, so I just wanted to thank you um, and, and still express some hope that we can do better in this next term, this next phase of the long-term operations. Um, in the face of climate change, um, thank you all for taking on this challenge. That's so, it. Thank you so much. <laughs> and the next uh, speaker is Deanna Serena from the Contra Costa Water District. Deanna, are you? some slides. When I got home last night from the meeting yesterday, I decided that my comments would be easier if you could follow slides instead of just listening to me when I'm speaking. So um, my name is Deanna Serino. I am the science and policy manager for Contra Costa Water District. Why she's bringing up my slides. Uh, I just mentioned that I'm very happy to see uh, faces that I recognize around the table. Um, also happy to see Cal represented around the table. I came out to California um, to do my PhD at Berkeley and I've now been studying hydronomics in the Delta for over 25 years. So um, as science and policy manager for Contra Costa Water District, my role today is 
is to make sure that we communicate science to inform policy. And so I want to bring in an issue to your attention that's related to something on your scope regarding Old and Middle River flow. But I want to start first with just a little background on, on Contra Costa Water District and where we are. Every water district agency who speaks to you today is going to tell you they're, you they are unique. So um, we are um, an urban water supplier within the Delta and then immediately adjacent to the Delta. Um, our service area is shaded green in the map, which is maybe difficult to see projected here, but you'll get the slides I understand as well. Um, we operate under, so we divert water under uh, pre-1914 water rights that are held by an irrigation district that overlaps with our service area. We divert water under post-1914 appropriative rights that we hold, and we are a CVP contractor. So all the water rights stuff you learned yesterday or, or rem were reminded of yesterday, lots of colors of water going on here. Um, we also divert from four intakes um, that are not the CVP and SWP export pumps that are the subject of the biological opinions you are reviewing now. The intakes we use are the four diamonds that are on the map in front of you. Um, we do not receive any water from the CVP and SWP export pumps that you're going to visit on your tour tomorrow. Um, they are in the orange circles on the map in front of you, okay? So because we have different intakes, um, because we have multiple sources of water, we have independent biological opinions and an incidental take permit from the state. So we have different requirements that govern us than what you're reviewing today, but we are a CVP contractor and, uh, and uh, integrate operations with them. So I have our, our four intakes named on the map with our diversion capacities. I just wanted to point out that we don't operate at capacity at all times. As a Delta diverter, we're chasing water quality. So we move our diversions around based on water where water quality is good and when it's good for fish. And so we have in our permits that govern our operations guidelines on when we take water from different locations to, to make sure we avoid impacts to fish. I should also mention that all four of our intakes have positive barrier fish screens. And so we're talking about fish screens that have very small meshes so that we're protective of anything larger than about 20 millimeters for most of our intakes, um, 30 millimeters at, at our earliest built intake. We built the very first fish screen in the Delta in 1997. So um, we've been, and that has a slightly larger opening. So it's protected to maybe 30 millimeters instead of 20 millimeters. So of the species we, we talk about today, really the only ones that our district has uh, effects on are the larval stages of the smelts. Um, no real effects on the semonids or the sturgeons. Anyways, on OMR, it is, I wanted to make sure we're, we're understanding what it is and what it isn't. Old and Middle River flow is um, measured at two locations on two channels in the Delta. On this map, they're on the, the purple um, squares, square circles, squares. Um, our diversions are too small to be measured by OMR. We have about 320 CFS. At those locations, our maximum diversion would be 0 0.0016 feet per second. It's actually below the calibration error at this instruments. Um, but we're in the but we're in the area, right? I mean. You see some of the green diamonds between those gauges and the CVP and SWP gauges. So um, reclamation and no long reclamation DWR don't operate to measured flow. They operate to an index, and that that calculation of Old and Middle River flow does include us. So we need to coordinate with them on a routine basis on how we operate so that we don't get in their way on on meeting OMR. And I flag this for you because. When they first got Old and Middle River flow requirements, keep in mind, we're regulated by separate permits. There, initially, there was a little bit of a conflict where we could hurt them, they could hurt us. We worked really well together and we operate really well now on a good coordinated weekly meetings to make sure that we are operating both within our own permits. But as the new consultation goes forward and OMR might get expanded and it might control more often, there, there is that potential for a conflict. Um, because of that, wanted to just refocus briefly on what is this OMR, because it's been over a decade since we did it. So OMR is a Eulerian indicator, so it's fixed locations. Keep in mind, organisms are going to experience Lagrangian. Um, they move around with the flows. They experience what, what is where they are. So um, a and, and fish that's more on the western side of the delta is not going to be experienced with seeing what's happening on those purple squares, right? So... Um, this is stuff I pulled from a presentation I did 15 years ago, so forgive me. Um, the, here are just, I'm gonna show you particle animation because, you know, that's 
I don't know that you got any animations yesterday. So these are two time periods with similar OMR values. So OMR on the left side of minus 4,600 on the right side of minus 4,800. Um, we're going to be releasing particles where the red dot is. Um, here, it's on the San Joaquin River at about where it meets, uh, old, old, where Old River dives into the San Joaquin River. Um, because the particles will leave the scope of the frame, I'm going to be tracking the particles that exited the bay to pass Martinez, which is on the western side going towards the ocean, and then those that are entrained in agricultural diversions at CVP and SWP. So I'm just going to start the animation. Um, Lenny did a wonderful interpretive dance to show us tides. Here we have the particles showing us tides. And of course, Josh also showed us the huge tidal range of velocities at these sensors. Um, so these are two time periods that have very similar net flow in Old and Middle River over these three time, over these three weeks. I'm showing you this for three weeks. And what we're seeing is that the movement of the particles, wh where things really go, um, is quite a bit different. So OMR is not a master variable that's going to explain transport. It is an indicator, and we're going to see in a minute where how, how exactly. Uh, it, it is a great indicator, but it's not entirely perfect, right? So looking at the results, the OMR that was actually slightly more positive um, ended up with more entrainment at CVP and SWP. The OMR that was more negative, more of those particles actually exited. These two OMRs differ by 250 CFS, but I don't know that that is within the ability to be predicting on transport. Um, so if we look at this, and we did this 150 times, I'm going to change the animation here. We did this 150 times, and we just plotted the results. And here we're looking at, um, on the bottom left plot, that's the USGS OMR gauges, so the actual measured flow in the river, um, and the percent entrainment based on the modeling simulation at that time. It is a great indication, right, that you get more negative flow, um, more negative OMR, you get more entrainment. Great indication. Lots of scatter. Now, because we're in the same range of OMR um, and we have separate permits, it, it is something we're interested in, in in getting an index, an entrainment index that represents entrainment at the projects without having the bycatch of including water users that are not entraining fish. So we developed back in 2012 a flow index that we could look at to say, okay, can we, can we mimic, can we have a different metric? that looks at the, predicts entrainment that doesn't have the bycatch of including water users that don't entrain fish. Um, so that's what you're seeing on the right. Um, so just in summary. Uh, take a minute to yep, wrap up. Yep. Yeah, that's this. So in summary, the Old Mill River is the Eulerian metric. Um, and it generally, it does a good job representing regional hydrodynamics, but it may not be the best indicator of entrainment. Um, and use of it as a regulatory metric has unintentional impacts on species. And what those impacts on species are is, right now we work really well with DWR and reclamation to, to be able to work to both sets of our permits. Um, if OMR requires more often, what happens is reclamation or DWR, DWR more likely would call us and say, hey, we need you to turn down your diversions at fish screens where you're not in training fish so that we can divert more. So we turn down by 100 CFS at fish screened intakes so that they could turn up 100 CFS at unfish screened intakes. So um, that's not happening now, but in the future with the state board looking at having new requirements for OMR and as this becomes more of a regulatory metric, it has that greater potential for conflict. And it does not benefit species to turn down diversions at uh, intakes that don't impact the species to turn them up where they do. Um, so we've been evaluating an alternative entrainment index. We've been using established tools such as the Delta Spelt lifecycle model with the entrainment side, that's the LCME. Um, we'd welcome the opportunity to discuss that with the panel. And our ask for you today is really that as you review the science that's supporting OMR, which is one of your charges, that you consider the bycatch of using um, such a regulatory index and see if you'd have any feedback on any something that might be a more targeted regulatory metric looking directly at the exports, for instance, instead of looking at, at something that catches those in the area. So that's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. That was very helpful. Maya, can we bring it out, Dr. Gartrell now? So uh, Dr. Gartrell was uh, formerly Contra Costa Water District and one of the early and most influential hydrodynamic modelers of the system. 
So, Greg, thanks for joining us. Hi, uh, uh, good morning, can you hear me, or good afternoon now? Yeah, yes, we we can hear you, Greg. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter, uh, for accommodating my uh, my schedule, and uh, uh, thank you to the committee for the work you're doing. I just want to um, uh, go over two points I think that are important uh, when you're considering these things. Uh, the first one uh, relates to water year types for regulatory purposes and for presenting results. Um, it's time to get rid of them. Um, the water year types were invented when spreadsheets were done with a sheet of paper, a pencil, a big eraser, and a slide rule. And now that I've said slide rule, I'm sure there are a couple of people in the audience who are going for their phones to Google what the hell that is. Um, the, the current ones that are in use now were made with pre-1990 data. We did this uh, around 1992. And the world's changed a lot. They're no longer valid for the kind of uh, 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 hydrology that we have now. They were designed, they divided up into approximately uh, 25 to 20, 25% of the years for each year type. Um, X2, actually, when we did that in 1994, was the first shift uh, to relating re uh, regulatory requirements to recent hyd uh, hydrologic conditions and not water year types. And it's time to do that with all requirements. For example, it makes no sense to require a fish flow in April based on a water year type that includes flows from last year and forecasted flows from May, June, and July that have nothing to do with flows in, in April. So what I'm suggesting is uh, it's time to move away from a water year type to for all uh, requirements to sliding scales uh, based on the important hydrology that it relates to that regulatory requirement. Same thing for presenting results. Um, I, we find that in, in uh, water year types, even in a critically dry year as was shown today, you can have uh, big storms uh, it, it doesn't make sense to uh, classify all critical years or dry years or wet years uh, the same. The second item is a caution on when you're considering summer and fall flows. Uh, the data that uh, have been used to uh, and analyses that show relationships with abundance in summer and fall flows uh, have failed uh, so far to consider autocorrelation of the flows. Uh, for example, if you uh, do an autocorrelation of flows uh, September, August, uh, July. You'll find they're highly autocorrelated with flows earlier in the year. Um, that it, uh, it, it's just the uh, way the hydrology works in this state. Um, it doesn't work on a on a uh, on an annual basis, but it does work on months. You get uh, highly high correlations, for example, between flow in April and flow in July and August. That means that. This, you get the same result using April flows as you can with July flows, uh, relating it to uh, uh, abundance levels. And in fact, you do if you do the, that analysis. So um, one is a caution on that to make sure you're relating that. And if you do really dig deep into it, you find out in both uh, the summer and fall flows that wet years are great, uh, the other years are bad uh, for a fish abundance. Uh, not really just uh, summer flows, but it's the other uh, flows all through. On fall X2, if you look at the data that were used to uh, initially uh, develop that, you find that uh, it's really driven by four years, four or five years, four or five wet years. And they were all wet years in the 95 to 2000 era. And they're all wet years that were followed by wet years. They're back-to-back -back wet years. So the, the, the fish experienced not just the wet flow in the fall, also in the winter and spring. So that's a second thing to, to look to. And then second part on that for the fall X2, uh, it should not be related to water your type. It needs to be related to something more, if you're gonna continue it, uh, more consistent with uh, what you're doing. For example, um, summer and, and fall runoff and uh, a trigger with, uh, with recent storms. Um, and I wanna thank you for uh, 
uh, again for accommodating my schedule. And those are the only uh, comments I had to make. Thanks. of that for the committee several points in there that would be very helpful it, uh, to submit it in writing to, to yeah the yeah, yeah I, can, I can do that I, I i have an analysis that uh can put forward on it that sounds great well thanks for joining us greg well we're going to take a uh, break for lunch now and we would ask that if folks could be back by 1 15 um, so that we can take advantage of the agency presenters who've agreed to stick around for a while this afternoon. So feel free to bring your lunch back into the room uh, and we'll get going again at 1.15. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to invite Darcy Austin with the State Water Contractors. And good to see you, Darcy. Okay. All right. 
Hello, hello. All right, thank you, um, Peter and um, the committee. Thank you for allowing us to come and speak in person this afternoon. I had a doctor's appointment, so I could not avoid that. Um, so it's really nice to be able to be here anyway in the afternoon, even though you're taking uh, the online folks. My name is Darcy Austin. I am the science manager for the state water contractors. You may have heard in the past of the state and federal contractors water agency, SWIFCA's science program. So we kind of take over where SWIFCA left off. Uh, so you may be surprised that there's a science program at the state water contractors, but it's very recent. The state water contractors themselves, um, we are an association of 27 public water agencies, and you will hear from one of our member agencies very soon. Um, and we represent the legal policy and regulatory interests of those contractors. We also work very closely with Department of Water Resources and other agencies, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you've already heard a lot about the high stakes and the big impacts that um, we're talking about today. So the BIOP and the ITP, they have significant water supply and economic impacts to our members. You've already heard two thirds of Californians receive water from the state water project. That's, um, that is 27 million Californians. And Lenny mentioned yesterday, that's one in 12 Americans. That's like a huge number of people. I also wanted to mention that about 7 million dis folks from disadvantaged communities also rely on water supply from the state water project. So the stakes are high, not just for the people, but also for the fish. Our science program has a big focus on how to manage water supply, but also figure out ways to help the ecosystem and the fish in particular. We spend about $2 million annually uh, in science projects that are intended to understand mechanisms and processes that underpin those relationships. We also host science symposia, and some of them have been in this very room, so uh, it's kind of nice that it feels like home a little bit. Our mission of the science program is to collaboratively, collaboratively fund and facilitate objective, relevant, and rigorous science that advances the understanding of factors affecting water supply reliability and habitat restoration for improved decision making. And um, one of the things is, so I'm the science manager, I have a counterpart at the SWC, but we rely on our technical experts at our member agencies. So that expertise is available to you as the committee, and we would also be interested in providing relevant literature to the committee as necessary. We are also very strong proponents of collaborative science, as I mentioned. So we uh, participate in the Collaborative Science and Adaptive Management Program, CSAMP, and in, in that uh, arena, we are looking beyond the impacts of the water projects and looking towards how to recover species, both Delta smelt and Chinook salmon. We collaborate with other science programs, including the Delta Science Program. That was my previous job. I worked for the Delta Science Program um, to fund relevant science. And we also help to fund their Delta Science Fellows. Uh, we sit on some of the other groups. We heard a little bit um, in passing really about the Healthy Rivers and landscape, Landscapes Agreements, which is AKA the Voluntary Agreement. And that really is seeking to uh, increase flows and habitat and seeks to understand the relationship between those two things. And then finally, um, we are uh, also part of a salmon recovery project called Reorienting to Recovery. And again, we're looking beyond the Im uh, impacts of the water project to how do we help recover species in these efforts. We wanna be a partner in science. So that's what we're here to do. We're obviously a part of the puzzle and when it comes to water supply. So we wanna be part of the solution as well. We heard a little bit about disagreements. So Matt mentioned that there's disagreements even within his own office. I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised there's disagreements among the water contractors as well. But I think we are moving away from combat science, which Eric Oppenheimer mentioned yesterday. I feel like this is a little bit of a new age. And um, the thing is, the disagreements persist. And so I will give you one little example. So Dr. Conrad was here today. She mentioned a paper by Sam Bashevskin and Brian Maharja uh, regarding temperature in the Delta. So we 
actually think that that um, comparison between instantaneous discrete temperature measurements and monthly inflows, you, you can't, um, you can't ignore the physical drivers that affect that instantaneous water temperature. So this is just a very small example. Of course, there's bit, much bigger examples of areas where we disagree. And this is where we can use your help. So we're very glad that you're here. And again, we already know, we've talked about it, very high impact. Um, there's a lot of impacts to people, to California, to water supply, but also to the fish. And that's something that, believe it or not, we care very deeply about. So how do we do that? And that is using best available science. So we urge the panel, I have three points that um, we urge the panel to weigh in on, and hopefully that does not expand your scope because you have plenty on your plates. So the BIOPS and the ITP include constraints on project operations to minimize take of species. And typically these are individuals. We would like, uh, if you could also take a look at and provide guidance on how to frame operational constraints when you're taking into consideration population level effects. So that's one thing. Another topic that uh, we want to encourage the panel to weigh in on is scientific uncertainty and framing of operational constraints. And then finally, it's about flexibility and optimizing. So the need uh, to use criteria to protect both fish and move water when it's safe to do so. So that operational flexibility that, um, that allows us to ramp up water supply when it's safe to do so, but then dial it back down when it is not safe to do so. And with that, that concludes my comments. Thank you very much for this important work that you are all doing. And thank you very much, Peter, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Darcy. And, uh, our next in-person speaker is Brian Shinstock with Roseville Electric Utility. Welcome, Brian. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Brian Chinstock. I'm representing Roswell Electric, um, its customers, and our fellow power customers here today. Uh, Roswell Electric, we're a publicly owned utility, uh, so we're non for profit. Uh, we have elected uh, council members, so in short, we're very community focused. Um, a quarter of our energy comes from hydroelectric resources. Some of that is the CVP. It's a very important resource for us. It helps meet our pillars of reliability affordability and environmental compliance um, for, um, for reliability, uh, like I spoke, energy, but also capacity. Uh, not too long ago, just September 22, we had capacity constraints, nearly blacked out California. The CVP stepped up and provided the needed uh, energy and ancillary services to keep the grid stable. Um, and then environmental compliance, um, electric utilities uh, have mandates now to be 60% renewable by 2030 and the remainder to be zero carbon by 2045. That's a very steep goal um, and we really have to work together to do that. Hydro is a very important resource because it's um, dispatchable, it's green, it's really the only utility scale sized um, resource that can uh, generate that kind of power. Um, like batteries, they can only shift power, hydro actually produces power. So we need that to meet again, affordability, reliability and compliance. We understand that there's many competing interests, um, but I would argue that uh, we all have in common, we wanna meet affordability, reliability, and compliance. Um, and we wanna do that for our customers, for all power customers, which are nearly 100 power customers. Um, and one thing that we really wanna look at and study is the, the emissions profile with it, not only on reduced volumes, but also the timing. So depending on the time of day, certain resources are online or offline, there's a different emission profile. So um, with that, if changes in operations happen, it's gonna affect emissions, which then turns around and affects everything that we heard this morning with fish, um, global warming, everything else. So we're here to help um, for everything that we can do. Please reach out to me and the rest of my team. Um, thank you for the time and consideration. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Brian. We're now transitioning to the uh, online uh, contributors, but I just ask you this. Uh, 
looking far enough down the list. Uh, so, so the next speaker is, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Kaysol Willie with Save California Salmon. And I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Just for all the speakers, if you weren't around this morning, uh, we are asking people to restrict your remarks to about five to six minutes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. My name is Kaso Willie. I am Pomo, Paiute, Wintu, and Wailaki tribal person, and I'm a staff attorney for Save California Salmon. For those unfamiliar with our organization, Save California Salmon is dedicated to policy change and community advocacy for Northern California's salmon and fish dependent people. We support the fisheries and water protection work for the local communities and advocate for effective policy change for clean water, restored fisheries, and vibrant communities. We are focused on ensuring tribal voices, tribal knowledge, and traditional cultural resources are considered and integrated into policies, regulations, and project development in Northern California. We aim to support tribes and the general public in engaging with issues related to water, water pollution, fisheries, and beneficial use issues. With that in mind, I would like to discuss a few ideas that were mentioned yesterday. First, <clears throat> I would like to encourage the community to consider traditional ecological knowledge, also known as indigenous knowledge, as a scientific source. I'll be using both of those terms interchangeably throughout my comments. The definition for traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge provided by the federal government is a body of observations, oral and written knowledge, innovations, practices, and beliefs that promote sustainability and the responsible stewardship of cultural and natural resources through relationships between humans and their environment. In December of 2022, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Council on Environmental Quality released guidance for the federal departments and agencies on indigenous knowledge. This guidance recognized that in order to make the best scientific and policy decisions possible, the federal government should value and, as appropriate, respectfully include indigenous knowledge. This knowledge has application in social, cultural, and spiritual systems, but also in physical and biological systems. Indigenous people have developed these knowledge systems over millennia and continue to do so based on evidence acquired through direct contact with the environment, long-term experiences, extensive observations, lessons, and skills. And this indigenous knowledge is a valuable component of being able to face climate change and preservation and protection of all resources, including water and aquatic, native aquatic species. California has also taken ag action to integrate traditional ecological knowledge State agencies, including the Department of Water Resources and the State Water Board, have policies that encourage integration of traditional ecological knowledge into their work. Bringing in this knowledge, bringing this knowledge into review of the Central Valley and State Water Projects is important because they were built and operate on the traditional lands of many tribes, tribes that are still here today. Some tribes have traditional ecological knowledge departments and have scientific data that could be invaluable, especially when it comes to cultural culturally significant species like salmon. Salmon, are, salmon species are extremely important to many tribes in California, including the Winnemowintu tribe whose creation story includes salmon and whose traditional villages were flooded by the Shasta Reservoir. Tribes have lived within and depended on California's water system since time immemorial, and they have unique knowledge and scientific data gathered outside of modern scientific methodologies. Next, I would like to briefly mention tribal beneficial uses, which were mentioned yesterday, that have been adopted by the State Water Board and are in the process of being implemented, sorry, implemented by the regional water boards in their basin plans and by the State Water Board in the Bay Delta plan. In 2017, two newer beneficial uses were adopted, tri tribal traditional and cultural use and tribal subsistent fishing use. Like I said before, 
the traditional tribal lands expand the state. The adoption of tribal beneficial uses is an effort to acknowledge and recognize the areas that still have importance to tribes and is important to keep in mind. And I just wanted to raise awareness on this issue for potential impacts to areas that may be designated in the future. Lastly, I wanted to draw attention to a point brought up yesterday regarding water rights. Uh, tribal water rights are relevant to this, to this discussion because there are federally recognized water rights for the Trinity River, which partially feeds the Central Valley Project. Any decisions made related to the Central Valley, Central Valley Project have impacts on the Trinity River and would impact tribes and their reserved water rights. And I'd ask the committee to keep those tribal impacts in mind when conducting your review. The Central Valley and State Water Project have great impacts to tribal and other environmental justice communities. Again, I request that the committee expand its scope of science to integrate traditional ecological knowledge for the most inclusive and holistic collection of data for its review. And I encourage the committee to consider tribal concerns, including tribal beneficial uses and tribal water rights to promote an equitable review. Save California Salmon appreciates the work of the committee and thank you for hearing my comments today. Great, thank you, Kazel. The next uh, speaker is Barry Nelson with the Golden State Salmon Association. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before you today and for uh, undertaking this really important um, um, uh, task. Uh, my name is Barry Nelson, representing the Golden State Salmon Association. It's uh, appropriate that you're hearing from Casile's organization and then ours, uh, because one of the things I want to talk about is the human impact of the ecosystem decline we're facing. California's salmon fishing industry, when it's healthy, um, which is supported by the Central Valley, almost all of the salmon caught in California and in coastal Oregon come from the Sacramento Bay Delta system. So when healthy, more than a $1.4 billion industry, 23,000 jobs, uh, and the future of that entire industry is very much at risk. The uh, salmon fishing season is shut down this year. None, there, no one is catching and keeping a salmon in the state of California this year. It's only happened um, uh, twice before in state history. It's clearly happening because of bad water management during a drought. Um, very shortly, we'll see the population counts for the, the 2023 spawning season. Um, we know, based on a whole host of, of incomplete information, that those numbers are gonna be bad. We don't know yet if we're going to be able to fish at all next year. Uh, it's also gonna be very clear that some of the listed runs, for example, the spring run, um, you know, has suffered truly catastrophic losses um, in the last several years. Um, we fish for the unlisted fall run, um, but we're, we're, our, our, our fall run is affected by the inadequate protections for the listed species. And the listed species, as they decline, also produce more restrictions on the salmon fishing industry. We have an enormous amount um, uh, at stake uh, fishing families, fishing communities um, from the central coast, from roughly Morro Bay until northern Oregon are almost entirely dependent right now on whether we maintain healthy Bay Delta salmon runs. Um, <clears throat> so I urge you to keep, uh, keep that in mind. Um, the work you're doing addresses the health of the ecosystem. That's enormously important, but it's also important for the people, tribal people, and um, um, fishing people, and there's overlap. One of Casile's board members is also on our board. Um, um, there's an enormous amount at stake there. So, so I just wanted to make sure I provided that context. Second thing, uh, one of your speakers earlier talked about dueling science, and there's no doubt that that's an issue. But there's another issue that has been increasingly a problem in recent years, and that is just not bothering with science. Uh, ignoring science is increasingly a very serious problem. Uh, a couple of speakers previously have talked about the voluntary agreements. Uh, you'll find if you dive into those agreements, there is remarkably little scientific support for, um, for the effectiveness of those agreements. I'd urge you, I'll mention a few things. 
EPA recently wrote to the State Water Board about those. Uh, Berkeley Law recently came out with a report on voluntary agreements. 2020, National Marine Fisheries Service uh, issued a peer review on two of the models used on the, to the Tuolumne River Voluntary Agreement. Um, and then uh, our community submitted joint comments to the Water Board that summarized the, the, the science from our perspective. Um, uh, this is not really a case of dueling science. This is a case of a voluntary agreement that's built enormous political support that honestly hasn't really bothered to make a serious uh, case for itself. It raises a real question about the role of science in policy making. Uh, this is not dueling science. This is a question of whether science is relevant. Um, so we urge you to take that very seriously. And since your 2020, 2012 review, we have an enormous amount of additional science about flows and temperature and habitat. Um, and we urge you to take a look at that. Uh, I'll forward our comments to the State Water Board, which summarizes a lot of that new science. We think there's really robust scientific evidence for dramatically stronger um, um, uh, dramatically stronger protections. Um, I, I will mention that I was disappointed to a certain extent when I saw your agenda because the NGO community has some very strong um, um, scientists. Uh, I wish they had been part of the presentations to you. I think you can get benefit from some of those scientists uh, through our comments to the State Water Board, but I'd urge you to make sure you seek those folks out. I'm not a scientist. Um, Last thing I'd like to talk about briefly is delay. Um, and just very briefly, um, the current Bay Delta standards were adopted in 1995. They were updated in 2018 for the San Joaquin side of the system. Those standards have still not been implemented. Um, the Bay Delta, triennial reviews are supposed to require, under the Clean Water Act, a review of water quality standards every three years. It's been 30 years since the Bay Delta standards have been updated. Um, 2008 and 2009, we had um, smelt and salmon biological opinions that were found by the administration to be inadequate. They need to be stronger. They were succeeded in 2019 by politically driven, science-free biological opinions. It's one of the reasons you're here today. Um, it was clear a decade ago that we need stronger protections than we had in 2008 and 2009. Um, and frankly, right now, it's not at all clear to us if that's being, if that need is being taken seriously. And your review will play an enormously important role in future consultations. Last thing I'll just mention here is that the voluntary agreements, which have been mentioned a few times, uh, those, that effort has been underway since 2011. Um, that process has set eight deadlines for a complete package. That process has missed eight deadlines for a complete package. Um, delay is deadly for tribal interests, for fishing interests, for the ecosystem, for listed species. Um, and the final point I wanted to make is that, is not just urging you to talk about the need to make sure that our policies are grounded in relevant science, but to make sure that the science, um, with your help, makes a solid case for urgent science-based action now. Um, there's always a need for more science. There's always a need for more monitoring. We have a robust, we have an ecosystem crisis, and we have a robust body of scientific evidence that points in, um, in a clear direction about the, the critical need for stronger flow and temperature protections. So I'd urge you in your deliberations to think about that, about the strength of the science and the state of the crisis and make sure that your recommendations do more than just urge decision makers to value science and ground policy in science, but also to give a sense of the urgency for taking that action now. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Barry. The next speaker is Craig Wallace from the Kern County Water Agency. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Craig Wallace. Uh, I'm the State Water Project Manager for Kern County Water Agency. Uh, Kern County Water Agency is a public agency created in 1961 by an act of the California legislature. 
The agency serves as the local contracting entity in Kern County for the state water project. Uh, agency water de deliveries serve over 800,000 Californians and over 650,000 acres of irrigated farmland. We own and operate infrastructure in Kern County to deliver state water project water to residents, businesses, and agricultural oper operations. We receive about 30% of our water supply from the state water project. And those state water project supplies are critical, uh, not only to all of those previous uh, operations, but also critical to our groundwater recharge operations. Therefore, the agency has a vital interest in the operation of the state water project. The past quarter century, the state water project has been subjected to increasingly stringent operational restrictions to protected list, listed fish species. Over the same period, we have seen little or no evidence of changes in species trends. In fact, the populations of Delta smelt and winter run Chinook salmon are at precarious lows despite such restrictions. Just this past fall, the federal and state agencies implemented an outflow action at a cost of 600,000 acre feet of water for the state water project with a value in excess of a quarter billion dollars, purportedly to benefit Delta smelt, although it is highly uncertain whether this costly action yielded any biological benefits for the species. Lack of understanding and confirmation bias have contributed to the combination of costly restrictions on operations, a lack of conservation benefits, and failure to introduce resource optimization into the decision-making process. That said, efforts are taking place to change the way we do business in the Delta. One example is through the Collaborative Science and Adaptive Management Program, or CSAM. There, efforts are being made to utilize structured decision-making to inform efforts to contribute to the conservation of Delta smelt. A second example is through the Healthy Rivers and Landscapes Agreements. There, flow and non-flow actions are being proposed to benefit native fish and metrics for success of those actions, together with monitoring to collect necessary data, which are being developed before their implementation and to inform adaptive management. Given its breadth of expertise, this committee can play a critical role in identifying a roadmap from emerging efforts and good intentions to successful implementation of the above examples and others. There are three ways we think you might be able to help do so. One, provide an honest appraisal of existing management actions, including an assessment of the extent to which they were developed, such as success criteria to evalu evaluate their e efficacy, and whether they were informed by a consideration of costs and benefits relative to alternative actions. Two, review existing monitoring efforts and how they can be reimagined to inform our understanding of the status and trend of the listed species, as well as the efficacy of alternative management actions. And third, provide recommendations for best practices to both communicate uncertainty attendant to management actions and regulatory determinations and how to reduce uncertainty over time. The CVP and SW con SWP contractors are public agencies that fund the operation and maintenance of the two projects. We have a substantial interest and expertise in the focus of this committee's work, and we hope in the future you will include us in your efforts. Thank you very much for your time and your service. Great. Thank you, Craig. I think there was a couple of other <clears throat> hands in the audience. Is there anyone else uh, who, who aren't on the list? If you're not on my list, you could at least uh, in introduce yourself to the audience. All right, sorry about that. My name is Lisa Kasner. I am uh, the manager of the Long-Term Resource Planning Division at the City of Reading's Electric Utility. And I'll just provide a little bit of background context for you. Um, Reading Electric Utility is a publicly owned utility. We're in Shasta County. We're a designated low-income area, and we have 13 disadvantaged community census tracts in our area that we serve. Of the 44,000 customers that we provide power to, over 17,000 of the meters are located in disadvantaged areas. The CVP hydropower accounts for around 33% of our um, power mix, depending on the hydro year. Reading heavily depends on CVP hydropower deliveries during summer months when customer demand is the highest. When hydro deliveries are lower than forecasted, Reading has to purchase replacement power. There are real quantifiable environmental impacts that I'll break down into three main areas, reliability, emissions, and affordability. 
during the summer of 2022, as Brian mentioned earlier, the state was in a crisis. There was a power shortage. We were rolling blackouts and issuing flex alerts and urging customers to conserve energy. The CVP provides critical capacity to utilities during times like that. Um, in Reading, we received the lowest CVP deliveries ever. We only received about 60% of what was forecasted to be delivered to us. We had to then go and try to find replacement power. We were paying around $800 a megawatt, and uh, we were unable to find power to completely fill our position to be able to serve load. So we went into that day not fully resourced, which is something that um, severely impacts reliability for us. With emissions, um, as some of you probably know, when we don't receive deliveries during those critical load times, we have to go and replace that power. And that's typically replaced with carbon emitting resources. So that um, significantly impacts our carbon um, emissions and impacts what that looks like for us. So in 2021, we were about 80% carbon free and we had normal deliveries from CBP generation during that year. Um, the following year in 2022, we were about 55% carbon free. So it totally um, impacts our carbon portfolio. And as Brian mentioned earlier, we have clean energy mandates that we're trying to meet. Um, we're really focused on those. It's one of the things that's most important to us in our integrated resource planning. So the CVP plays a, a strong part in meeting those energy compliance targets. Um, additionally, the low income and disadvantaged areas are primarily the ones that are most impacted by carbon emissions and poor air quality in those areas where the generators are located. Um, as a power customer, we pay the same amount for our share of the CVP power, regardless of whether it's a strong hydro year or whether um, it's not as abundant um, precipitation. With 33% of our portfolio coming from CVP hydropower, um, variability in deliveries exposes us to a risk of increased power supply costs. Um, during that event in 2022, it cost us around $4 million to replace the power that we expected to receive from the CVP but did not. And those costs are um, eventually passed down to our low income and disadvantaged customers, creating disproportionate impacts for them. Any change in seasonality of the flows or allocations to Sacramento diversion would significantly impact not only Redding's emission profile, but the state's emission profile, its ability to reliably serve load and disproportionately burden the state's most vulnerable customers. We're urging this committee to consider the wide ranging environmental impacts um, and the benefits from CVP power generation, including the critical role in supporting carbon reduction for the state and um, consider all of those impacts when evaluating the operations of the CVP. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. I think we had two other in-person speakers. Good afternoon. Um, I'll keep my remarks brief. Uh, my name is Lena Perkins. I, um, I'm here representing City of Palo Alto Electric Utility. Uh, we date to 1896, so we have Roseville beat. Um, but uh, we're a public agency, and you know, I just want to thank everyone here for their commitment to their public service um, through being in this process. All the knowledge that I see in this room on this committee is incredibly appreciated. And as you can tell, you know, I don't think there's a single actor in this room that isn't in, of the customers and the, and the involved parties that isn't in, in a crisis. The, the, the fisheries are collapsing, tribal interests um, and water rights haven't been respected. Water customers um, are struggling like never before in the face of new challenges and as a power customer, um, this is an unprecedented crisis, um, probably in the last or transition, you know, crisis, an, an unprecedented change for at least the last 50 years that we're looking at. Um, and, you know, I, I want to keep my comments really focused to the second point of the first cycle of the study. Oh, and, and as an aside, I have a PhD from Stanford in engineering, and so I'm a modeler in a former life, so I don't envy you your, your job, but, but I'm, there is so much knowledge here and the Bureau of Reclamation um, 
Carrie Fox. I'm going to give a shout out. He has made he has made this project so much more dynamic, and there's an incredible amount of um, knowledge. So don't underestimate the staff members that you have in the Bureau of Reclamation that operate this, as well as you know how how quickly WAPA can tap dance to try to capture the most value from the CVP um, power as possible. So um, you know when you have questions about how it's really going to work they know and they're nuclear engineers, you know, that are now running these things since they're really, really smart. Um, so, you know, to the second point, how can we use um, better modeling to, to, for decision-making for operations? You know, I think that the current, as one of the prior speakers before lunch mentioned, you know, the current prescriptive course buckets of this is this water year, this is that water year, thou shalt do this, it hasn't worked for species and it hasn't worked for the other folks either. And so I would really urge you to not underestimate the capabilities of the staff that will be implementing um, what, what this committee and other public process decide uh, because they have shown me um, incredible um, ability to be nimble and adapt, um, and specifically Carrie Fox again at USBR. But you know, I would urge flexible, carefully designed, flexible um, guidance for operators because it's not just that the course buckets didn't work then for the type of water year and, and for species survival, it's that our hydrology and our temperatures are different and tougher coming forward. And so even if it had worked then, it wasn't gonna work going forward. So you have that, you have incredible research studies for going into weather forecasting for better, more granular weather forecasting there's a lot of people interested in that. You're, you're not alone on that front. There's incredible resources there as well. Um, and you know, lastly, I'll just say for City of Palo Alto Electric Utilities, I should have said this first, I guess, but we have been carbon free since 2013. We have a deep commitment to um, the environment, carbon neutrality, we, carbon free electricity, and we have been um, accounting for our hourly emissions since um, 2018, you know, back when nobody cared. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we, you know, there is a, there's a deep commitment there and we, we recognize that, um, that this project has to serve a lot of purposes, but um, anything that you can do to um, preserve the interests that need to be preserved um, through your science process, but also the, the within the day flexibility, that hourly flexibility, because projections are for there to be negative power prices in the middle of the day in December and January going forward. You know, and that also means, you know, gas plants are gonna run all day long just to cover the evening ramp um, and, and things like that. So just huge environmental impacts and the, the financial viability of these systems to do anything. <laughs> going forward it is, is really you know at risk because these are old projects um, and we haven't invested in infrastructure you know in a big way in several decades so thank you thank you so much for those comments <clears throat> I think we have a couple of other speakers at the back Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Paul Hooser. I'm the um, general manager for Trinity Public Utilities District. Um, we're an area of origin for Trinity River. Previous speakers uh, for Trinity River Water mentioned Trinity. Um, and I'd like to kind of encourage you, as other speakers have too, including your analysis, impacts on hydro power generation and by extension, carbon emissions. Um, and I'd like to share a real world example about why that's important. And I guess to backtrack a little bit at the risk of stating the obvious, I don't think that entails a massive analysis of emissions from reservoirs because you're really only looking at impacts of changes to operations. So, um, but like other speakers have talked about and alluded to, even if the changes you recommend don't result in a net change in hydro generation, the timing of that generation could have huge impacts on carbon emissions. And to go back to a real world emission that might not, or example that might not be popular, but is accurate. So I've been in California for 18 years, over 18 years, and 
certainly following restoration efforts in the northern part of the state for that long, particularly on the Trinity River. I've been the general manager for Trinity PUD for over 12 years. The salmon fishery actually used to be, as small and rural as we are, it was a considerable economic driver um, in our area. Uh, candidly, it no longer is because there really is no salmon fishery any longer. Uh, in fairness, the steelhead fishery still provides some economic benefit in our area, but even that is declining. But I, I'd like to go back as an example and the 2000 record of decision that dramatically changed flows on the Trinity. Um, you know, at the time, uh, uh, diversions to the Central Valley were much higher. Um, in, in round numbers, it um, almost doubled, or actually more than doubled, uh, flows to the Trinity River. Again, on these five water year types that I agree with other speakers are really outdated given uh, our modern technology now. But the expectation was more than doubling flows down the Trinity versus diverting it to the Sacramento would result in considerably better fish returns. The reality is fish returns are lower now than before those uh, higher flows were implemented. You know, while it was a 2000 record of decision, litigation unsurprisingly kind of delayed those flow changes. But since 2005, that has been the case. We have a lot of history, not just of a lot more water down the Trinity, but more than 300 million in direct expenditures on habitat. And when I say direct expenditures, that ignores the considerable value of that water and power that could have been delivered. And the carbon aspects of that are important, right? So if, just in case you don't understand the plumbing of the Trinity, because we're kind of an afterthought in the CVP, that we consider ourselves pretty important. Um, the you know, tr uh, Trinity Reservoir is a roughly 2 million acre foot watershed. It's located at, uh, well, Full Pond is 2,370 feet above sea level. So it's the most efficient generation, hydro generation on the CVP because of the, the drop. So there's two tunnels, 17 and a half feet in diameter, run 11 miles through the mountains, come out into Whiskey Town Lake, and then more tunnels that come into the Keswick after bay for Shasta. So when you divert the water, every acre foot that's diverted generates 1170 kilowatt hours more than if it just flowed through the Trinity power plants. So if you think of that example, I, I haven't gone back and done the math, it wouldn't be hard to do, but around numbers, it's probably, it's certainly in excess of 10 million additional acre feet that didn't generate hydropower. And it wouldn't be a difficult exercise to determine the increase in carbon emissions that resulted from that. Now. Obviously, as someone living in Trinity, had that resulted in a restoration or even improvement in the fishery, it, it might be reasonable to say, okay, yes, here was the cost of the action, um, and it was worth it. But as I mentioned, fish returns are lower than before those flows started. So as you look at potentially doing things like that again, I think it's imperative that you look at the impact on uh, hydropower production, its timing, and by extension, it's the carbon impact of that. Because you you, you could argue, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a big globe, but in aggregate, certainly that record of decision dramatically, uh, at least, well, it increased carbon emissions uh, from, you know, as a result of changes in the operation of the Central Valley Project for no benefit in terms of the fishery. So, um, just the example I'd like to leave you with, and, and I hope very much that you'll consider hydropower and by extension carbon emissions in your analysis. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Any other speakers from in the room? I think we got everyone. Well, yeah, we've asked um, everyone uh, speaking to us today, if they have information or the PowerPoints, please send them to the academies. Uh, absolutely. So we're now going to the virtual audience. And um, let's see, just going down through my list here. Um, uh, did Lisa Marie jo join us? 
So Lisa Marie Wyndham Myers is with the Delta Stewardship Council. No okay. comments. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, is, did Regina join us? So on the list here, we have Brett Baker from the Central Delta Water Agency. Is he online? He's not at the moment. Not at the moment, no. Uh, let's see. Dipanja Manik with the West Bengal Pollution Control Board. So is Dr. Manik with us? is getting easier. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eric Mork with the Western Area Power Administration. Yeah, he is. Welcome, Eric. So perhaps as we're waiting for Eric, I'll then go to Glenn Spain after Eric, uh, followed by Heinrich Albert. So is Eric with us? Uh, okay, great. Um, if if the So what we'll do, we'll go down the list and then we'll have a call if we happen to miss anyone. Glenn, Glenn Spain. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Pacific Coke Federation of Fishermen's Associations and the Institute of Fisheries Resources. Uh, hey, Glenn. Good to see you. Thank you, panelists, uh, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, a little bit about our organization. Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations is the largest trade association of commercial fishing families in the West Coast. Many of our uh, folks make their livelihoods in whole or in part from salmon fishing, which is, of course, closed now, not only here, but in most of the rest of the coast for various reasons we will discuss. I'm also the uh, program director and Northwest Regional Director for Institute for Fisheries Resources, which is the science arm of the fishing industry, dealing with issues like this. And uh, you will be hearing more from us and we will participate as much as we can in this process. Uh, we've also assigned one of our contractors, Deidre De, uh, De Jardin. Uh, Deidre is with California Water Research Associates, and she will be also providing some services to the committee as a modeler. She's done a lot of uh, wonderful stuff along those lines. To put it into perspective, our industry, that is the salmon fishing industry, are people who need water in the river. They need that water to provide for the salmon runs that have been a billion dollar industry in the past in this state and provide tens of thousands of jobs or support those jobs up and down the coast and inland. This year, we are closed. That means no fishery. And the reason we are closed is because of water decisions that were deliberately made uh, during the drought in the year 2000 and, uh, and the year uh, 2020, I mean, uh, based on a biological opinion from the prior administration that would have uh, essentially resulted in the extinction of their uh, salmon runs. The reason is primarily, and I want to bring your attention to this because this will be under discussion um, for a while, and that is because the current status uh, and the protection standards um, that were written into and frozen into the uh, 2019 Salmon Biological Opinion, which was began implemented in 2020, 
allow water temperatures at least two and a half degrees higher than what could be considered protective water temperatures. That is, uh, it allowed water temperatures to go uh, uh, up to and even above 56 degrees Fahrenheit. For people who speak centigrade, that's 13.33 uh, uh, centigrade. When the best available science now says that that uh, water um, threshold, that hot water threshold for salmonids should be about 53.5 Fahrenheit or 11.94 uh, degrees centigrade. In other words, we are basing our management of the California Central Valley on water standards that are fatal to fish. Um, it turns out that if you keep the water temperatures at that 56 degree um, Fahrenheit limit, uh, which is what's allowed by law uh, under Water Right Order 90-05, that is 30 years old, it doesn't reflect any of the better uh, science. If you keep temperatures that way, you wind up with more than a 70% mortality rate of eggs. And that's what was done in 2020. Uh, as a result, it killed a great number of the eggs and a great number of the juvenile before they could be fry and move out to the ocean. Uh, as you know, there's a three-year lag time, so the fish that did not come in and could not be captured because they don't exist, missing in action in 2023, were the same year class of the juveniles that went out through that hot water curtain in 2020. Uh, one measure of the success of that um, run would be what's called the egg to fry survival rate. The usual 16 year average of egg to fry survival rate is about 25 to 30 percent. In 2020, we reached near record lows of 11.46 percent. That means only about one in 10 fish made it to the ocean from the, from the eggs. In 2021, the same standards were applied. We hit a record low, then record low, of 2.56% survival rate. That's about 1 in 50. Uh, and in 2022, we hit a 2.17% uh, egg to, to uh, fry survival rate. This is for the wind run Chinook, the most threatened or actually endangered, since it's endangered under the ESA, stock in the Central Valley. Now, these are not numbers for spring run, but they're comparable. Uh, and they're not numbers for the fall run, but those were comparable in terms of that same kind of precipitous decline, all because a deliberate water decision was made under the 2019 biop to maximize, quote unquote, maximize diversions at the expense of salmon. Uh, this is not a mistake. This is not, this, this is not just climate change. This is not just drought issues. Uh, yes, there was a drought during that period of time, but all the impacts of drought were deliberately exacerbated for the salmon run in order to feed too much water to too many people in what was a record drought. Uh, so that, I want to bring that to your attention. Uh, I also am providing you a, a letter from and the Pacific. We'll possibly wrap up in the next minute I'm, or so. I'm that doing, doing that, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also providing you a letter uh, dated September 12th, 2022 from the Pacific Fishery Management Council, which as you know, is a federal body that manages our West Coast salmon fisheries pleading with the agencies to change that standard to uh, what uh, is uh, uh, the best, most protective standard in accordance with the best available science. There was an earlier presentation, I forget the gentleman's name, but he talked about the Martin et al. studies, the insight studies on egg survival uh, under temperature standards. That's where we need to go. Those need to be the standards or we will continue the march toward extinction. Uh, less than a 3% survival rate is a, a, an extinction level. And we've done it two out of three, and there are only three years in three cohorts in our life cycle. 
So we are on the verge of extinction for most of the salmon in the California Central Valley, which, by the way, I want to emphasize includes the Trinity. The Trinity is part of the Central Valley Project because that's where a good portion of the water in the northern part of the state comes from. So with that, I will close and thank you for uh, taking this on. Uh, we will certainly continue to engage and provide whatever information we can on fisheries impacts. Thank you, Glenn. And we look forward to receiving that letter and uh, a summary of, uh, of your, what you've just given us. So thank you. Uh, moving on through the list uh, is Heinrich Albert with the Sierra Club with us virtually. Next on the list is Kevin Howard with the Northern California Power Agency. No. Um, uh, Ellen Weir with the Grassland Water District. No. And uh, Lena Perkins. City of Palo Alto. Yeah, she's been here. Alina's been here. Okay. Is there a, a, anyone else? Perhaps we could ask them to raise a hand online. If So, uh, so we have two more, spe two last speakers, or or just Deirdre. Okay, Let, let's go with Deirdre uh, first of all. So, Deirdre, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, asking people to restrict their comments. To Hello, uh, this is Deirdre Desjardins with California Water Research. Um, and uh, I'm a consultant with Institute for Fisheries Resources and Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations. Um, and my research background is in nonlinear dynamics and complex systems theory. And I did research uh, at the Center for Nonlinear Studies at Los Alamos and the Santa Fe Institute. And I worked on climate adaptation in the California water sector since 20. Just a moment, Deirdre. Yeah, so Deirdre, if you could check, you may have hit mute uh, unintentionally at your end. Can you hear hear me? N now, now we can, yes, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, in 2022, I made comments to the Water Board that the Department of Water Resources snow runoff forecast had fatal flaws in that they were based on analog years in the historic hydrology. The first half of 2022 turned out to be the driest six months on record, and the California legislature requested an audit of DWR's snow runoff forecasting based in part on my comments. There has since been research by the U.S. Forest Service that indicates the source of the snow runoff forecast errors is related to increased Sierra forest root zone deficits, which are going to continue. Um, in late 2022, I began a comprehensive literature review on the effects of climate change on Pacific Ocean atmosphere dynamics and California precipitation and temperature. The more I looked at the literature, the more I realized 
we're in the middle of climate change. There was a regime shift in Pacific Ocean in 1977, and there was a warmer, wetter period from 1977 to the next regime shift after the 1997-98 El Nino. And um, these were both associated. The shift after 1997 to 98, we saw a shift to a more La Nina-like pattern in the tropical Pacific and a cold Pacific to cattle oscillation pattern. And it was associated with a reduction of precipitation in January and February across Western North America and a developing mega drought in the Southwest. Um, the reduction in precipitation accelerated in 2013, and there was also a step increase in temperatures that is associated with hot droughts. And um, I've um, pull, uh, been doing extensive analysis of the NOAA Climate Division data, and it's really clear we're no longer in the 20th century hydroclimate. The precipitation distribution has flattened out. There are more very dry and very wet years. And the dry years are much drier due to increased atmospheric thirst. Um, there's been intense research on the pattern effect of cool sea surface temperatures in the Eastern Pacific. And climate models experiments are showing La Nina-like trend is likely to be caused by a slow recovery from anthropogenic aerosols. And if so, this La Nina-like pattern will last for decades. Um, and that will have major effects on precipitation in the Southwest and in California. Research also shows that this pattern effect may have masked higher climate sensitivity um, and, and we could see more warming for a given increase in CO2. And this has been the subject of a major international research effort through the CLIVAR program, which is coordinated through the World Meteorological Organization. This is the best available climate science and it's cutting edge and I'll be providing a summary and some information to the uh, panel. And as far as climate adaptation, I would say water projects have been using a greedy strategy that tries to optimize operations to move as much water as possible uh, in any given year to the San Luis Reservoir and reservoirs in Southern California. But the, in our changed hydroclimate, this creates major risks of draining Northern California reservoirs to near dead pool. And we have to move to much more risk-based management um, um, for both the reservoirs and water supply and for ecosystems. And we also need to recognize that human systems have a much greater capacity to adapt than ecosystems. So thank you very much. And I look forward to getting you further information. And we look forward to receiving that information. Um, so I think that concludes the open mic. What, one more? Yeah, but please do. So Kevin, please introduce yourself and uh, try and keep your remarks to just five or six minutes, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you very well. And we see you. Uh, can you can you hear me now? Yep, yeah. we hear you very well. Hello, this is Kevin. Uh, can can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Kevin, we we hear you very well. Hello. Yeah, hello. Okay, so it looks like you can hear me. Uh, well, well, thanks a lot for the opportunity to provide input and offer support to the committee. 
I'm Kevin Howard, the Federal Power Program Manager for the Northern California Power Agency, or NCPA. And NCPA is a joint powers authority serving 16 municipal utilities within the state of California who serve over 700,000 in-use electricity customers. These customers consume approximately 12% of the electrical load served by the California Independent System Operator, representing a significant percentage of California residents and businesses. The Central Valley Project Hydro Generation Facilities provide a large component of NCPA's generation resources, since NCPA members hold the rights to over 40% of the pre preference power generated by the Bureau of Reclamation and delivered by the Western Area Power Administration. My comments cover two main topics. First, a request to consider the hydropower operations component of the CVP and state water projects. And second, an offer to partner with the committee to help explore the science related to managing environmental and economic impacts related to any changes to operational practices within the CVP, which limit the volume and timing of hydropower generation. Any further limitations to the flexibility of hydropower operations will almost certainly increase greenhouse gas emissions, which goes against California's goal to be carbon neutral by 2045. This is an area of study that should be added to the current evaluation of long-term operations of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. Hydropower is a defined purpose of the CVP, which provides a large amount of renewable, very low carbon, energy to the state of California, given the current environmental goals of the state to limit emissions and emissions related climate change, one of the strategies is to electrify most of the energy use within the state by incorporating electric vehicles, heat pumps, etc. along with integration of large amounts of renewable energy into the electric grid. This will ultimately result in an increase in the overall electrical load on the already strained system within the state in order to charge vehicles and meet heating, cooling, and industrial loads. This will exacerbate the issue which led to rolling blackouts in California during the summer of 2020, as well as energy emergencies which nearly led to rolling blackouts in more recent years. These events tend to occur during extreme weather events, in these cases, extreme heat events, which are becoming more and more common as climate changes continue. These energy emergencies almost always occur during net peak loading times of the year and are caused by significantly increased loads that begin during early evening hours in California when consumer loads ramp up with increased cooling and other activities at the end of the workday. This also corresponds with the time of day when California's large solar generation capacity is ramping down as the sun sets. Vehicle charging and increasing electrification will accelerate this issue. In order to maintain grid reliability and prevent blackouts, all other sources of generation that are dispatchable are called upon to fill the gap as solar generation drops off during these peak loading times. If hydropower is unavailable during these times due to lack of water or other operational limitations, natural gas fire generation will be called upon to fill that void. For example, during recent stress conditions on July 20th, 2023, when the Cal ISO declared an EEA-1, 60% of load was served with natural gas resources, which is clear evidence that the state is dependent on the gas fleet, which will likely continue for many years. Any decrease in hydropower availability will increase the utilization of natural gas generation, increasing greenhouse gases and other harmful chemical emissions. Another simple example of a factor that can have substantial air quality impacts is that the green hydropower production from each acre foot of water diverted from the Trinity River Division to the Sacramento River results in approximately three times as much hydropower generation due to being routed through additional hydro turbines. These diversions can also supplement and conserve the Shasta cold water pool to support seasonal and annual biological protection requirements. Maintaining the availability of clean, affordable hydropower is also in alignment with the current federal administration's environmental justice initiative. As you saw in an earlier presentation, over the last decade, CVP power has been dangerously close and has sometimes exceeded market prices. 
the reduction of CVP generation availability or the restriction of system flexibility further increases the cost of the federal hydropower resource, which disproportionately impacts the economically challenged communities that are prevalent among NCPA members service territories. If changes to system operations cause additional cost increases, the state is at risk of losing these clean hydropower resources. I recognize the challenge of adding hydropower and emissions considerations to an already complex set of issues associated with water quality, water deliveries, and the biodiversity of the system, but believe they're very important issues that need to be considered. By utilizing science and data to develop appropriate tools, we believe that power and emissions interests can be optimized while honoring other environmental and water goals. NCPA and our members have been working closely with the Western Area Power Administration to explore an approach to modeling and evaluating these areas of concern, and we have developed an initial emissions model as a starting point for consideration. We would love to hear your feedback and ideas on this model. We also offer our support as a resource to the committee to identify expertise, as well as helping to identify data sets that can inform modeling and analysis. Thanks for your time and uh, effort on this and, and for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for those comments. And again, as with many of the other speakers, uh, please do forward that information or a summary where that information can be found uh, to the National Academy staff. So with that, Maya, uh, I think we are done with the open mic session. And oh, perhaps what I'll ask is that we really appreciate the uh, staff folks who have agreed to stay on this afternoon because we didn't get to everyone's uh, questions earlier. And we can take what tw 20 minutes or so uh, to, to uh, address some of those questions. So I don't know if Dr. Conrad, uh, uh, you're Matt, uh, your reclamation. Uh, Noah, Steve, do you want to come? Sit, sit at the front and we'll. So in particular, if you had questions for the fisheries discussion this morning, uh, tee them up because they're all here. And then Josh and Lenny from yesterday are also here. Is Mario with us? No, no? he had to step away. No? Okay. Um, but I know there were a number of questions that we were compiling in David's uh, Google document. If, and if you have, would like to ask one of your questions, follow Renee's example and tilt your tent card, please. Okay. <clears throat> Should we start? Should we start with Renee and then go to Denise? Thanks for hanging out, y'all. Josh, um, I have. Renee, can you use the handheld mic? Your voice is too soft for people online to hear. Sorry. No, it's just an interface. <laughs> um, I have a question for you, Josh, from yesterday. On the the X2 plot that you showed, the red and the blue line, and then also the um, the one with uh, temperature uh, below Shasta that was similar. The run of river, will you explain to us what that actually is? Yeah, so real In briefly. In both cases. Yeah, so real briefly, and I, there is a slide that sort of describes them, but the run of the river is an exploratory modeling CalSim 3 run that basically has flows moving through the reservoirs, except for those that are limited by Army Corps of Engineers flood control rules. And there's no CVP diversions. And the only diversions in there are senior water rights diverters that are allowed and can divert uh, off of run of the river. So there's no releases being made for uh, senior water rights diversions. Uh, effectively, you can sort of think of it like the dams being left open, except for making sure that um, flooding does occur. Copy. In the case of Shasta, the Shasta one, though, there's still a reservoir there with reservoir temperature effects. It's not like the reservoir wasn't there and it was actually the temperature coming into Shasta. You know what I mean? Yeah, so the run of the river temperature run uh, would reflect the water the temperatures of the water coming out 
uh, just based on the reservoir storage that's in there due to um, trying to think through why there would be, why there might be a little bit of water in there due to flood control in wet years in May or April or something like that that's being stored instead of release due to the flood control curves. Okay, thank you. Can we come across to Denise? Okay, Denise, then we go to Steve. Uh, you want me to use this one? No, that's okay. Hey, Denise, I'll just say one more thing. We can, you know, I think we're going to talk more about modeling at the next workshop, too. So if this is something that's interesting, you know, let Laura know, and we can make sure to have modelers here who can talk more about the specifics. Sorry, Denise. Thanks. Uh, I had two questions, um, one for Josh and one for Steve. Um, for Josh, um, we had some good presentations on operations yesterday, and a lot of it was fairly kind of immediate weekly decisions. So this led me to think about our, our statement, the task is about long-term operations. What does long-term operations mean as opposed to short-term operations or some other kind? So that's the question for Josh. <laughs> and um, the question for Steve is, um, you had a very elegant diagram, you know, of the life cycle, right? And um, you talked about temperature and oxygen. And at what point, and what do we know about food being a limiting factor in those early life stages? Because you kind of, you, oh, it's on the diagram, but you didn't really talk about that. So those were my questions. Okay, so real quickly, thanks for the question, Denise. So long-term uh, probably is more of a, art than the science. So I think uh, we tend to call our consultations long-term operations. I think the uh, probably the best way to think about it could be um, between years. So because I think there's storing as one of our actions and storing tends to happen across years so that we have cold water resources uh, the next year uh, with some of that, some some of the approaches that are being considered and have been used have been trying to link across years uh, stored water uh, for releasing and diverting in, in future years. So um, that's probably the best I can do when it comes to long term. So does that mean that we don't need to worry about um, operating the pumps in response to local conditions on a fairly immediate time frame? Because that's not really into year, right? So, That's yeah, and I think just the other point is, you know, on the slides that I gave you, I gave you some ideas on sort of the real-time tools we have for sort of inter-season or weekly or monthly approaches to operating. But, you know, our consultations and our thoughts about the operations of the project span and include things like what's going to happen over many decades of time. So in that context, it's long-term, but Lenny wants to add to this, so. I, maybe I could add, just, I removed long-term operations from the title of my slide. The way that I see it, it's a jargon term to describe the permit period for the consultation. Okay. Long-term okay. offices. Okay. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you, period. that's good, I got it. It's independent of real-time operations. I got it, It's just I got a it. jargony term. Thank you. Yeah. But we, I think it is important for you all to be thinking about interannual operational choices. So uh, thank you, Denise, for that question. That that was uh, one of the many things I did skip over very quickly or not touch on at all. Touch upon at all. Uh, food is very important for juvenile salmon. Their growth depends on the food supply and the water temperature. And both of those things can be influenced by the water project in different ways in different environments. So below reservoirs, um, at least certain times of the year, those can provide a subsidy of high quality food to stream dwelling salmonids in terms of like daphnia and whatnot coming out from reservoirs. Uh, but I think more of the effects are uh, negative. The disconnection of floodplains in particular, those are areas of very high quality for juvenile salmon to rear in because of incredible uh, invertebrate production that you get in flooded uh, wetlands. And uh, there's much less access to that now because of, of levees and reduced flooding in general because of this water storage during the wet period. And then the delta itself has been, as you saw from some of the maps, radically transformed from a, a tidal marsh that probably had, from, if I recall from Jim Clern's work, maybe two orders of magnitude more production coming from, from marshes through a tridal food web that would have been supporting salmon. Um, most 
salmon bearing river estuaries. Uh, the estuary is an area of growth for juvenile salmon, and it's not so much in ours. The fish just migrate through and they don't really grow at all. Okay, maybe we can talk about this at another meeting. Thank you, Steve. Um, I think I wasn't very specific in my in my um, question. I was reflecting on some of the comments we got during the open mic session about about egg to fry survival, and so I was really at the much earlier life oh, okay. history stages. So we can talk about it okay. uh, another time. But okay, yeah. Sorry. So uh, perhaps we could now go to Steve, Steve on line. Steve Brand. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Sorry I can't be there. And I, it seems to me we all just got together about a month ago to talk about food webs. So I won't ask about that. The, uh, this may be diving into the weeds a bit, and, but I want to target it towards uh, Steve and Matt maybe. Is You both talked about the uh, uh, complete life cycle models. And I think for both salmon and, and smelt and as, as sort of the, uh, I want to say, shining example of, 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 a, of a modeling approach for those fishes. But I'm really having a difficult time understanding how, in fact, they're actually applied uh, to CVP operations. You know, because of what we've seen with the CVP is clearly a, uh, it's geographic. There's there's diversity in where flows change and temperatures and so forth like that. And and the model, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have a spatial component to it. So I'm just wondering, how do you apply those in terms of a space, spatially to CVP operations? Are they actually used in any kind of an operational sense or sort of post facto sort of or pre facto kind of an analysis? And, um, and, and I guess what are, what, what, are, what are the drivers in that case and what are, what's the output you're actually looking for? Now, maybe this is something we can tee up for the next meeting together, but go ahead, have a shot. Yeah, so I, uh, Steve, thanks for that. I, I'd be happy to come back and talk to the committee. It probably would more if you're interested in that. I, I can give you an overview of the winter run Chinook life cycle model. It is indeed spatial in a kind of a coarse sense. Uh, it is driven by inputs uh, that come from things like uh, CalSim 2. It uses um, other models like HECRAS, which describe the depth and velocity changes according to the hydrology. So it, we can look at uh, habitat suitability in large areas like the upper river, the lower river, the yellow bypass, and the delta. And the model accounts for movements among those habitats during the rearing phase. So it uh, captures really a lot of the dynamics that I was trying to tell you about today in a, in a simple way, but in a way that I think is uh, helpful. It has been used in a couple of the biological opinions, basically, because there's so many effects is what I was trying to get across to you today. Um, some positive, many negative, and to be able to integrate that over the whole life cycle is, a, is the necessary task. And the model is capable of doing that, um, I think, fairly successfully. There's always a tension between realism uh, and tractability, uh, connecting it to data and all of that. There's a, a huge technical challenges, uh, but I'd be happy to come back and tell you about the progress we've made there. Has in the last in several now, yeah, and it will be. It's being used right now in the planning. Oh, and I should say that the analysis generally um, comes to us in the form of a few scenarios. There's like a baseline and a couple alternatives, and that is what we analyze. So we'll get the calcium runs from our colleagues at the bureau, and we run that through a complex set of models that come out. Uh, and the outputs are things like uh, projected uh, trends in abundance and survival through different life stages. Uh, the, the production of, of fish into the ocean and, and things like that that are that are pretty diagnostic for understanding what what's going on overall with population dynamics. Matt, yeah, did you want to add? I'm sorry, what? Uh, yeah, did you have something to add on the smelt side? Oh, yeah, I, I can add to Steve's question. So thank you for it. Um, I think in one of the earlier. Q and A's. I did mention there's there's multiple delta smelt life cycle models that are now in existence. Um, what I can say about the 2019 opinions is that at that time there was one published individual based model, Kenny Rose et al. Um, we didn't have access to it, and we didn't. Um, um, so all we could do is read the paper and report what the paper said, basically. Um, we were working on our own life cycle models. Other people were working on some, um, but it, but we got very clear direction from Washington, D.C. that we were not to use uh, life cycle models that hadn't been peer reviewed. 
in that consultation. So um, we weren't able to use anything in development at the time. Uh, the reason is actually not a bad one. You heard today how much controversy there is with everything we do. And so um, there was concern about um, basing decisions on something that might be preliminary, might get changed. Um, so that's that. Um, we do now have them, and they were used in the biological assessment that we got from Reclamation recently. So, um, but it is, and to your second part of your question, Steve, Kenny's model is spatial. Um, the statistical models that we developed with our Lodi office are not. Um, we have variants that are hybrids of individual based and statistical that are spatial, but they don't do space well. So yeah, we, we are where we are with, with that part, but they are being used this time. Thanks, All right. Thanks a lot. Luis, did you have anything to add? Can I add something to that to yeah, first, sure. Steve? So, um, mm. I think, you know, we are, we did use the Delta smelt life cycle model. Uh, we've also, as part of our Central Valley Project Improvement Act, been working to develop decision support models for the different runs of Chinook salmon and working now on sturgeon and steelhead models as well to do sort of multi-objective, multi-species uh, modeling of different scenarios. And slightly differently, we've used those tools sort of in two ways. One, for running through what the experts around the Central Valley think are sort of the best restoration opportunities and then running that through the model to see how much it influences the objectives of increasing uh, Chinook salmon populations. And then we've actually done competitive solicitations focusing on the candidate scenarios that are prioritized as most likely to achieve the outcomes mm -hmm. that we're interested in. And then we've also used it to do sensitivity analysis to look at what parameters influence the outcome the greatest and are doing competitive solicitations for research to try to focus our research efforts in that direction so that we can improve the models and improve our decision making over time. So we're hoping to talk about that during the second meeting some too um, with the other life cycle model discussions. Great, right, thanks. Uh, and David, can we go to David next? And we'll work our way back along the line. So I had a question about groundwater surface water interactions. And it's really, I think three, the general question is how much those factor into the analyses you're doing, but then to be more specific, how much do they affect the relationship between what comes out of the reservoirs and what gets to the Delta? And I guess the second part is how important are they for temperature? And the third part, which is more general is how, how important do you see them for the species conditions that you're studying? like to take that first. I think we could provide a general response to that and we'd like to table that for the next meeting when we'll have our modelers here that can tell you how they incorporate that into calcium in different ways. So I think, if, yeah, they'll have a better response than we would. Yep. Great. Uh, Joe? So I have a question from Steve. I mean, this this may be a little bit too detailed. So in the in the morning, you showed this beautiful graph between the survival rate versus temperature, and then it basically comes down and drops down at about fifteen, from seventy five to about three four percent, and it it really struck me because usually the fish data are a little bit scattered here and there. Not like, you know, when we teach aerodynamics, you know, lift coefficient versus Reynolds number, they fall in one over another all the time for air blades. But anyway, so uh, it, it struck me. But then uh, uh, one of the speakers, one of the, the, the uh, open mic speakers, Glenn Spain, he basically, uh, probably you heard, yeah. that he said that when the biops were changed, from 11 point, uh, 13 point three three to eleven point six oh so eleven point six to thirteen point three three there were completely annihilation of, of X and they don't have after three years everything disappeared. So but thirteen point three three is within your limits. So there must be uh, uncertainty on these things which or maybe I'm going too detailed here. 
Well, it's really a, a issue, I think. Yeah. This is science based, and your your stuff is science based. It looks like biopsy is science based, but he claims that it is not science based. So uh, it's, it's a little bit of issue. Maybe yeah. you can. You can I've, uh, I've, I'll try to untangle this so I can. There there are a number of things there. This is pretty complicated. So that the the figure I showed with the such the beautiful data, those were from laboratory studies. So when you you can estimate a model very precisely from that. And when that model is then estimated from the field data, it comes up with a lower temperature, which is below 13.3. Uh, the biological opinion then changed to reflect that. And someone else can probably help me out with exactly the timing and the criteria and all. Uh, and then that was relaxed somewhat in, in a revision to the biological opinion. It's not really clear in a multi-year drought whether those targets, even if we were committed to meeting them, are physically achievable. Um, you have to reduce the flows so much that uh, the, the habitat for the salmon constrict, and then there may be issues going on with actually the water velocities. I alluded to the importance of oxygen. Uh, the salmon spawn in very deep areas now, which is not what they did evolutionarily or you know 100 years ago. Um, and there's some new studies coming out now that suggest there, there could be a velocity component to this as well. As well. Um, I'm not sure if that helped. Uh, okay. There are so many other factors involved. All you have is laboratory uh, data. So, yeah. A laboratory data, pretty nice agreement, but a lot of uh, complexities. Maybe your, your thermal stress model might be the one which you should be using for the biops, <laughs> because then that will take care of the depth of the water and the temperatures and, and the year of operation and stuff. So, that, that, I mean, it, it's so much science to be done, it looks like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like in everything, you know, you, you find um, a, a new result and it sheds some insight, but it raises a number of new questions. And uh, there's so much attention to all this, too. It's a little bit um, ironic, maybe, that in some of these things, I think we, we know more are some of the most controversial areas because they're so impactful. Um, other things we know nothing really about, and there's probably a lot going on there and because we can't measure it. We kind of ignore that. It, it's a weird dynamic. And Patrick. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you guys for uh, sticking around. I appreciate that. So um, uh, if you were here, you heard uh, Michael Anderson's talk. Frankly, I was a little disappointed in it. I, uh, uh, in, in statistics and Albert and I were talking about this earlier, uh, stationarity often is viewed as changes in the mean, but it, we think of it as changes in variation as well. And that's so important to keep track of and people often uh, forget about it. So uh, the message I got from Michael's talk was that it's complicated, but clearly there's patterns going on, uh, especially with the variability. And um, uh, I've had the opportunity to use uh, oceanographic and atmospheric data in, uh, as in estimation to see where fish go and how they survive and so on and so forth. And it seems like we could be much more advanced than what we're, we're doing now. And so my question is, uh, are you using Michael's input at all in anything? And, uh, and if so, at what scale and uh, is, it, is it helpful? This was um, indirectly included in one of my questions about climate change. And maybe this goes back, Denise, to your clarification on long-term op operations. This is a consultation period that we're dealing with now. And we keep hearing, well, we're in climate change. Yeah, we agree with that. But we don't want to kick the can down the road on what may change in the next consultation period. On the state side, it's a 10-year permit. It's not defined on the federal side, but given that we want to be aligned, I'm guessing that we would do this every 10 years. Um, and that's where we would like some feedback there. Because when you sit in our seat and you're developing the rules for what you need to do today, you don't really integrate what Michael was showing in the way that you you know need to start thinking about it for the future. That's just the nature of the work. It's government work, right? You've got to get this done today. But we know it's there. And we would love impact, I mean, love feedback on how we could start integrating what you all see in our rules 
that will help us get to a better place in the future, knowing that this is on the horizon. And even things that we could do now, you know, on the science side, looking at our adaptive management side, did we miss a question or two in our adaptive management plan? Um, are there other things we need to consider? So that goes into that box of uncertainty that I was talking about that we framed as questions. Um, there's just different ways of looking at that. So, so it's, it's not being used directly now at the moment. Um, yeah, well, CalSIM, yeah. So yeah, and CalSIM, we actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thank you, Matt. So we do have a way to model that, right? And we have calcium runs that evaluate the out that the outcome of that climate change prediction. And you could do the biological models that have some prediction. But in terms of the the real time rules and the scope here, yeah, not in that sort of way. But we could look look at it at a at a larger view. So yeah, Great. thank you, thank you, thank Matt, you very much. That makes sense. So if we can go to Pedro and then back to Michelle for the last yeah. word. I'm not 100% sure this um, question is um, appropriate necessarily to this group because I think not everybody was here, but a lot of people ended their talks yesterday by saying that coordination was critical. And so I would be curious to hear your opinions about what is what are limiting factors for coordination. I think that's a really uh, interesting question. I there's some biologists who are still in the audience here who meet, you know, on a weekly basis and talk more frequently uh, with their colleagues on technical teams related to real-time operations. Uh, you know, I'd contrast that maybe with some of the long-term planning that we do in consultation, where I also think that there is weekly coordination on a multi-year consultation process. And, uh, so there's a lot of coordination going on there. We do have a lot of science partnerships also where we get together to talk about some of these topics. Um, I think typically all the agencies are there, but um, at the same time, people are really busy because they're getting pulled into consultation or they're getting pulled into real-time operations. So there's le those things take away from our ability to advance and coordinate on the science that's necessary. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, we have to sort of balance how we staff and resource those three areas, long-term planning, real-time operations, and sort of coordination of, of the science that's advancing and helping us adapt over time with new tools that are going to help us evaluate and approach potentially the next information and consultation or better understand what we're seeing on the ground. And I think uh, that's probably the place that I think may suffer the most is just being able to allow staff the time to go because they're getting pulled in these other directions. Sure. Thanks. That's a, a great response. I, I think several of us have been wondering about the mechanics of coordination at different time scales with respect to operations. And one thing I was wondering about is, do you guys, are there internal mechanisms to evaluate how coordination is functioning? Is that part of the coordination is sort of this meta analysis of how coordination is working? I can take a stab at that again. And I'm mostly going to reference what we're talking about in the consultation for how we do coordinated ops under the new permits. We spent a lot of time talking about governance because one of the items that we recognize over the last few years is there's, there's off, often not been a clear path if staff have a disagreement on what they're seeing, how that gets elevated up. So we spent a lot of time thinking about that elevation process, how the groups coordinate, and then thinking of a decision team that's between the staff folks and the directors to help sort it all out. And then maybe that decision that's, we call it the subdirectors, could come to some sort of resolution on whatever got elevated. As a general matter, we would love the staff folks to figure this out, but it's not always perfect. And I think, you know, one item, one word that we like to use here is consensus. But as design, when you're in a group, consensus, it's hard to be the individual that disagrees in that, you know, in that dynamic. And because of that, you know, we want to make sure that all the individual agency members have an opportunity to weigh in. If they don't feel comfortable, they can elevate it up. 
So if you look, and we could provide this at the new governance that we have described in our consultation, that's verbatim between the biological mm -hmm. assessment and ITP application. There's a very clear structure, not only among the staff, but then the different committees that make decisions on water ops and the modelers, the subdirector team and the directors. And include, there's actually language about how the directors go about decision making too. And then there's even a nuanced piece on the state and feds have different ways in which they approach governance and who has ultimate decision authority. We even address that in some indirect way too. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been thinking about this a lot because this is part of the lessons learned since 2008. Thanks, Simon. Right, please do. Thanks for the question. Um, what I wanted to add is, that in, I think that as Lenny and Josh talked about, there's a, quite a bit of coordination among the agencies. But I think as you hear from the public comments um, in the open mic session, there's also a need for coordination and communication with external parties. And that's one of the things that would be great to get your input on because it's so important that the science that we're using is transparent and it's clear how it's being used um, because there isn't always a shared understanding of what we are doing. So um, your input on how to achieve that effectively uh, would, be, would be great. Um, I had one more thought and it's escaping me right now, but, but I, 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 yeah, that was the other point is that's one of the things I was trying to emphasize yesterday in my comments about adaptive management. That that's one of the pieces that we'd like to solve is a strong word, but get to a better space in terms of coordination with interested parties. Great. Thanks, Louise. So again, <clears throat> to go to Michelle for the last question, and then we'll turn to the uh, agency folks if you would like a parting shot at the committee <laughs> on, on your way out the door. Um, Great. Well, well, thank you all, all for your time today. Um, I, I had a two-part question that really followed up on Patrick's comments around climate information. And the first is, um, we've heard a lot about various adaptive management plans over the last couple of days. And I'm curious, kind of, to what extent those consider climate change? And y'all sort of started to answer that question. I just wanted to probe it a little bit more. Um, or is adaptive management defined slightly differently here? And climate not climate change, I should say, not, not a large component. Um, and then kind of as a part of that, I, I wanted to understand a little bit more about kind of consensus around climate sensitivities within the larger system. Um, and do you, you know, pe people in the, the open mic session and kind of throughout have talked about various aspects of management which are sensitive to climate change. I'm sure we could all rattle off, off many right now, but do you feel like there's a general consensus or feeling of maybe completeness is not the right word here, but around which key aspects of operations um, or key metrics are most sensitive to climate change and where it, where it really needs to play a bigger role in, in decision making. Who would like to start? I, I think I, I do have one point that I think is sure. relevant to this that I didn't get to make. Um, and that is, when you look at the biology of the animals that I'm most familiar with, the salmon, their responses to things like temperature are highly nonlinear. And as, as we manage the system more towards those thresholds and the uncertainty around those relationships becomes more important and the opportunity for exceeding them and having really bad things happen rises and rises. And that's the kind of trajectory we've been on is going right up to the edge uh, and maybe over it sometimes. And I think that's going to be an increasing risk. And, you know, some of these these are cold water fish. They're going to uh, just be under more and more pressure like this. And that's what I'm just trying to get at with maybe my last slide is, can we find ways to give, get them away from and ourselves away from those edges where we have a little more room for error? Because there's almost no margin anymore. I don't know if that really doesn't answer, I think, your question entirely. But. No, it's helpful. So, I mean, climate change impacts on the water projects themselves are pretty profound. I think we've heard about that for the last couple of days. Um, the projects rely on snow to be there to help them store water over lengthier, lengthier periods of time in the spring. If that's not there, um, then they're, you know, the, as that cycles through time, the storage levels will be lower on average. 
the flood flows will be higher but shorter on average. That's going to affect how much they can export. That's going to affect how, how much and when outflow leaves the delta. So it's completely integrated. Um, from the perspective of the my the, I'm not saying myopic as a bad thing here, but when you work for the Fish and Wildlife Service and you're consulting on something, in this case, water project operations, and you're consulting for a fish, we're certainly looking at the predictions of climate change, but Lenny mentioned that permits maybe got a 10-year shelf life. Um, and that's if something doesn't change so profoundly <laughs> that we have to reconsult and open it all back up again. Um, the 2019 uh, opinions were reconsulted in part because of chronic drought in the 21st century and what was happening to fishes as a result of that. Um, so in that sense, climate change is, is causing us to do something and we're trying to do something, but also that longer view of long-term strategy as much, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service, I'm sure it's the same in NOAA, have think tanks in places, but but in a consultation like this, that's not where that really can happen. Interesting. Um, we're sort of looking at a, a limited range of time and what we're presented with, hmm. so. Um, so on the adaptive management and just underscore what Matt said, I think that you said it really well, Matt, that not yet it seems, but that's one of the things we're trying to do is understand at what time cycle is it appropriate and what factors need to be considered when evaluating any of these management actions. And I think that your question plays into that. The other thing I just offer is that one of the materials and that's relevant to your question that we could provide to the panel is the State Water Project has produced a new um, delivery capability report that adopts a new approach in the 2023 report. It's a believe a biennial um, report that then it, this this approach that is new this past year is under uh, estimating the risk involved um, in, in not meeting. Well, what are the what's the risk profile for the the state water project to be able to provide its deliveries and takes a climate um, approach to that. So we could provide that for additional context to the panel. That'd be great. Thank you. So actually, Louise, you do have the, oh. the, the mic. Do you, do you have any parting message? Um, let's see. I wanted to not be the first to do this, but I sat in the wrong spot. To do that. <laughs> um, so, well, I am I'm glad this isn't the last meeting. Uh, there's obviously so much more to talk about. Um, I, I keep finding myself gravitating towards the question of what is the charge for, for the panel. And of course it's written down, but exactly how you take in all the information that may or may not be directly relevant to what's listed on that page and consider it. I think that's going to be a, a real challenge. Um, I, 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 so I'm reserving the right to say more tomorrow after I've had a night of sleep and I'm on the bus with you and I'm gonna have more thoughts. Um, so, but I do want to note that one of the things that I heard uh, quite a bit during the open mic session was an encouragement for you all to review parts of the voluntary agreements. That's, um, voluntary agreements are something that the Department of Water Resources is heavily engaged in and is a signatory for, on the MOU and the Memorandum of Understanding. And one of the things that I just think would be really helpful to provide to you is that there is a separate scientific basis report on the voluntary agreement proposal that is being separately peer reviewed and we expect comments next week. So I would love the panel to be able to consider that. And as you consider your charge and the urging to also review the voluntary agreements, please look at all the relevant materials there. Um, there is, as Eric Oppenheimer said, a big process that's going on. Um, and while there may be a nexus, um, important to keep um, your charge to uh, what is what is reasonable and consider all the other materials that have been provided separately in a separate venue for those voluntary agreements. So um, let's see, I guess the last thing I'd say is it's reflecting on some of the life cycle modeling. There's been a several discussions on that. And I think that the real, the person I wanna point to is Renee Henry, who's actually leading 
uh, one of the leads for a reorienting to recovery effort that considers and is and is expanding on life cycle models and how they can be used to prioritize um, different investments in the salmon life um, re restoring habitat and opportunities for for salmon to complete their life cycle and so there's the in addition to the life cycle models and their use for operations, which is really the scope for this panel, be aware that there are other supplementary efforts um, going on that that have um, take a really broad approach and get a lot of valuable input into the improvement of available models and think broadly about how they can be used. That might be really good fodder for thinking about how we approach adaptive management for the water project operations, is that there's other examples, even within this system, that you can look at for, for thinking about that piece. And thank you for your time. Looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. I would just add uh, to what I've already told you that I am at your service for any kind of information that you need about anadromous fish, uh, salmon, steelhead, sturgeon. Uh, I lead a laboratory of about 100 people that have been, a lot of whom have been working for the last 15 years to try to improve the scientific basis for all of this water management related to the anadromous fish. And I'm happy to connect you to them uh, or I can present in their stead and if you want me to come back. At any time, I'm available to do that. Well, I will second the things that Steve just said, um, and Luis, thank you to all of you and to everybody who's participated, and all of the talks that preceded mine to make mine a lot easier, because I didn't have to do so much background. Um, I, I have been asked to provide some life cycle model references by Patrick, but like Steve, I'm available to provide information um, to the panel. I guess I have to provide that through Laura, so we'll do it that way. But um, And then I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. I won't be on the field trip tomorrow. Jana Afonso, who's my endangered species uh, colleague in my office and the expert for our office on that, will be. And I do feel like there's probably, a, a, you've got plenty of great scientists that can talk about biology. I think it, it will be actually better for the panel to have that regulatory expertise available. So um, thanks again, and I will pass this along. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, and the other panelists here and uh, the National Academy of Staff Science, or uh, National Academy of Science staff who helped us uh, get this underway with all of you. So really appreciate this. We're just jumping in right now. And I think maybe at the next meeting, we'll give you a life vest or something like that. and. I don't know if I can finish my presentation right now, Peter. Probably not. Okay. Um, but if you look back at it, um, I think what's interesting is, you know, there's been a lot of uh, really, I feel like, great discussion and dialogue and uh, people providing a lot of information to you. And you can see that there's a lot of opportunity to do something uh, else, given the needs to adapt for climate change, need the, uh, to address flexibility. Uh, with water supply and, and uh, hydropower. And all of that is hinged on having tools that help us make choices. And uh, the three large issues around diverting water and storing water and releasing water and blending water are all really critical decisions that uh, reclamation has to make choices about. And we can't decide if the voluntary agreements or some other proposed action or something else that someone else might decide to want us to implement is better or worse unless we have good tools. And so um, I really appreciate the hard work you're starting to think about what those tools are that will help us evaluate uh, the trade-offs, uh, biological, hydropower, and, and water supply. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the to the field trip because I really don't get out in the field very much and I'm really looking forward to additional workshops where we'll be able to talk about some of the monitoring and modeling, hear from other interested parties uh, around the state uh, this spring and this winter. And so thank you very much.